Ok, mesdames, messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. We want to start. Ok, thank you. Donc je vais passer la parole maintenant à Monsieur le Président de la conférence pour le début de la vraie partie technique de cette conférence. Monsieur le Ministre, vous avez la parole. Merci, M. Clivaz. <coughs> Mesdames, Messieurs, Honorable délégué, j'espère que le déjeuner s'est bien passé et que les batteries sont complètement rechargées pour toute l'après-midi. Nous allons donc à présent débuter la première séance sur le thème « Agir collectivement et distribuer à l'échelle mondiale ». Notre monde, comme vous le savez, évolue. Le secteur postal se doit constamment de s'adapter et de se réorienter pour répondre aux exigences de notre société qui est en mutation forte. Plus que jamais, les opérateurs désignés doivent donc eux aussi s'adapter rapidement aux nouvelles tendances liées notamment à l'évolution des technologies et s'adapter aux exigences des consommateurs. Les représentants des pays membres de l'UPU et les acteurs clés du secteur postal vont débattre des défis et opportunités que rencontrent les postes aujourd'hui, de la question de savoir qui sont leurs clients, quels sont les modèles commerciaux à suivre pour s'adapter à l'évolution, je dois même dire aux évolutions de nos économies. Je voudrais vous présenter rapidement l'animateur de cette séance. Je vais me contenter d'introduire. Ce sera M. Peter Sommers. M. Peter Sommers euh, donc, fut membre du comité exécutif de l'opérateur belge Bipost jusqu'en juillet 2014. Il a dirigé la filiale Parcels National de Bipost, qui a connu une croissance rapide et totalisé jusqu'à 475 millions de dollars de chiffre d'affaires. Cette filiale d'un effectif de près d'un millier de personnes couvre les activités de colis de Bipost, entreprise à clients B2C et entreprise à entreprise B2B en Belgique, les activités de colis et de courrier du régime international de Bipost en Belgique, en Europe, sur le continent américain et en Asie. Cette entreprise a également lancé le service novateur Shop and Deliver, donc achat et livraison. La filiale Parcels National de Bipost est opérationnelle dans 10 pays européens, aux États-Unis d'Amérique, au Canada, en Australie, Hong Kong, Singapour et Chine, etc. Peter Sommers est un directeur chevronné dans les secteurs de la poste et de la logistique internationale. Plus de, fort de 25 années d'expérience à des postes de direction dans les grandes entreprises de transport et de distribution en Belgique, aux Pays-Bas, au Royaume. Uni. Donc, euh, Monsieur Sommers, je vous passe la parole pour euh, introduire ce panel et ensuite euh, l'animer. Je vous remercie. Merci bien. Merci, Donc, euh, je vous Merci bien, Monsieur le Ministre. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the UPU World Strategy Conference. Uh, after this long introduction, I don't have to introduce myself anymore. Um, so uh, I will go directly to the point of this conference this afternoon. Um, and the reflection on the key trends and drivers of change will for sure influence 
the future of the postal sector and the decisions of the next UPU Congress in Istanbul. And before we start the sessions and the panels, I would like to ask your full attention for the opening remarks of the Director General of the UPU, Mr. Hussein. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to the Strategy Conference of the Universal Postal Union. It's now time for us to get down to serious business, and this Strategy Conference is a milestone event for our organization. First, and first of all, we'll take stock of the status of the strategic priorities adopted by our member countries at the 2012 Doha Congress. A lot has been achieved since the Deputy Director General and I began our mandates in 2013. The International Bureau structures were adjusted to meet the objectives set by the member countries and to respond to the financial constraints on member countries and the UPU. Since 2013, we have stayed the, the course using our organization strategy as our daily roadmap. The UPU's essential activities for all its member countries, regardless of their level of development, were strengthened. As well, major new work areas were launched and new approaches explored and significant progress made in implementing our business plans. Your Excellencies, we have a, a short video which we want to give you, which will just give you a small uh, reflection of some of the achievements we have done. So I would like to request uh, the, the technical people to show up the video, please. Thank you. In 2012, Universal Postal Union's 192 member countries adopted the DOA Postal Strategy, a four-year roadmap for the global postal sector. What progress has been achieved so far? Posts are interconnected like never before, but more data must be exchanged with customs and transporters to improve quality of service. Today, much international mail fails to be delivered within five days. And on average, it takes six to 10 days for a typical customer to receive goods ordered from an e-tailer abroad. Only by better integrating postal, customs and transportation systems worldwide and synchronizing processes can end-to-end -end quality of service improve. Reaching foreign markets is difficult for small and medium-sized enterprises. Yet leading economists say governments have much to gain in reducing trade barriers. In Latin America, many small businesses that would have never exported their goods otherwise use the post to reach new markets through easy export initiatives launched by their governments. Based on these experiences, the Universal Postal Union is now helping other countries improve the access of small businesses to foreign markets with its own Easy Export program. The Postal Network must be a critical partner in bringing trade barriers down. Posts are operating in a double-digit growth industry and their parcel volumes have exploded over the last decade. The Universal Postal Union's new e-commerce program provides global solutions to meet customers' evolving needs, such as a new parcel service for e-commerce items, a cross-border return service for goods bought online, and an electronic customs declaration system to speed up items clearance. Innovation isn't just about the latest technology. It's also about reading the market accurately and creating the services customers will need tomorrow. Never before have so many people been part of a formal financial system thanks to postal services. Globally, posts offer financial products to more than one billion people. But there's still an incredible potential to extend financial inclusion to 2.7 billion unbanked people in the world, as well as provide accessible and affordable money transfer services to migrant workers through postal services including the Universal Postal Union's rebranded electronic postal payment service. Post offices form the largest physical network on the planet. You often find them in rural and isolated areas where financial institutions don't exist. 
That's a powerful network for fighting exclusion and empowering citizens everywhere. Steady progress is being made on achieving the goals of the Doha Postal Strategy. But as postal services undergo a radical transformation, only a sustained effort will ensure that the global postal sector continues to deliver integrated, innovative and inclusive solutions for development. Well, I'm sure that small clip will give you an indication of uh, some of the major ideas that we develop at UPU. Ladies and gentlemen, this video you have just seen is only a tiny sample of our projects and activities since 2013. If you want more details, please welcome to Ban next week when we have the Postal Operations Council and you get more of that. Uh, we have, will have the opportunity over the next two days to discuss many of the UPU's successful activities in this cycle. The four main goals highlighted apply to all of us, the International Bureau, the UPU bodies, governments, member countries, regulators, designated operators, and our suppliers and, and customers. I wish to take this opportunity to thank all those working for the success of the Union alongside the International Bureau for their support. In particular, their financial support and their active involvement within the UPU structures. After a little over two years as the head of the organization, I can now look back at the progress made and ahead at the, ch at the challenges we face in ensuring that the UPU is able to ever more effectively meet our expectations. The roadmap that guides our actions and decisions reflect the global postal environment, an environment marked by profound changes and by certain tipping points. And these tipping points represent both challenges and opportunities for the postal sector. One of the first tipping points I would like to highlight involves the dramatic shift in the client's behavior and consumptions. Today, clients want to be able to access service anywhere, anytime, from their smartphones, computers, and tablets. They want environmentally friendly products tailored to their preferred method of consumption. And they want those products to be delivered at home or right next door. The advent of mobile financial services and online banking and the new players on the market require that the posts also adjust their behavior in the financial service sector. The new consumer is digital and, and concerned with sustainable development. This modern consumer has a totally different gauge for the values of a product or service. This poses major challenge for postal operators, both in their business positioning and in terms of physical and virtual architectures of their contact and delivery networks. Adapting to this new condition is no longer an option. It is a necessity. But rather than viewing this new reality as a constraint, posts should consider it as exciting opportunities. E-commerce, the internet of things, digitization of financial services, and new mobile payment solutions, as well as the vast quantity of data generated and captured by the postal networks. These are all major assets and position the postal sector at the heart of the te technological revolution. The second tipping point is the shift in the postal traffic and in business models of the post. Although the letter post volumes are dropping, parcel volumes are steadily rising, bolstered by the economic boom. Yes, we are witnessing a radical shift from documents to merchandise. This is leading to a new business model in the post to fit the new revenue structures. Today, letter mail generates less than 50% of the revenue of the 20 biggest post offices worldwide. The message is quite clear to us. The third tipping point is the global economic recalibration in favor of emerging and developing countries, which are changing today the face of the world. Global postal traffic is mirroring these evolutions, 
with a drop in the proportions of traffic between industrialized countries and corresponding rise in the south, north, and south-south exchanges. Migration is a factor in these trends and indeed a driving force. Here again, the postal sector and the UPU have a vital role to play as a facilitator for international exchange and drivers of technological, economic, financial, and social inclusion. Your Excellencies, as the international organization responsible for postal sector, we cannot ignore these tipping points. We need to in integrate them into our strategic reflections and actions. This brings us to the second goal of our strategy conference after the midterm report card on the implementation of our strategy, uh, strategy for this cycle. Over the next two days, over the next two days discussions, we look forward to hearing your experiences and views as we delve deeper into these subjects and many others. This debate will inform our understanding of the environment in which the UPU and the postal sector are evolving today and will evolve tomorrow. Innovation, e-commerce, trade facilitation, competition, regulation, financial inclusion, information and communication technologies, social, environmental, and economic responsibilities, etc. None of these subjects will be sidelined as we discuss this in the next two days. Together, we must take stock of our organizations and the postal sector today and shape our future tomorrow. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I will leave the stage. You've heard so much about me. Now is the time to turn to these eminent uh, professionals and uh, great leaders we have assembled here to give us their perspectives. And then I'm sure whatever great ideas that will come out of this place will be forming our future strategy. Mr. Moderator, I wish you success in your deliberation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hussein. Let's kick off. I have a short presentation because one of my challenges this afternoon is timekeeping. So I will go fast. Are you ready for a quick scan, a quick overview of some of my personal views on the industry? So let's kick off. What is going on in our industry? Transactional mail volumes continue to decline. Direct mail is stable. Digital mail is not taking off as a new product driver for posts. Financial services are gaining importance and some posts are becoming big banks today. Many European posts show high profits, but profit is coming mainly from the declining mail business. Canada Post will stop home delivery of mail. New Zealand to switch to alternative delivery. Mail volume is declining, as you can see, with an average of 5% per year for the sample of 19 postal operators, according to an Accenture study. Mail decline escalates even faster than expected in some countries, especially in the Netherlands and Denmark. Mail volume reduced with 60% between 2001 and 2013 in Denmark. Impressive figures. E-commerce is growing fast and with double digit percentages in every continent. A well-known fact in the meantime and an irreversible trend. According to a Boston consulting study, 70% of the e-commerce has a cross-border dimension. Asia-Pacific counts for 40% of the revenues of the global cross-border e-commerce market. This is great news for all of the postal companies who deliver now the majority of the cross-border parcel and untracked packets. But who will win the e-commerce parcel delivery battle? Who will win that? Will that be the posts? the integrators, or the big four? Google, eBay, Alibaba, or Amazon? The jury is out. A lot of questions are valid and unanswered today. Will Amazon survive as a pure player? We see that pure players in the US are opening stores again. Will the same happen in Europe? Amazon invested a multi-billion dollar in the supply chain and through Amazon Prime, the shipping costs are exploding. Is free shipping and free returns sustainable in the future? Will same-day delivery become the new normal? 
The US Federal Aviation Administration gave Amazon permission to test prime air delivery drones. Is drone delivery really going to happen in our industry? According to a study of the financial research company of Bloomberg of last week, Amazon drones could deliver packages for just one US dollar. Amazon also filed a patent for mobile 3D printing in delivery trucks. Can you imagine you order something online and while the delivery truck is driving to your home, the order is produced in 3D printing? Amazing Amazon. Just have a look at this. The FedEx homepage showing all their logistics services. For every service, today you will find a new provider, a startup, a digital alternative, or a new competitor. Is this disrupting or supporting FedEx business? Do the check with your own postal websites and services, and you will have the same result. A lot is happening in our industry. FedEx announced last week their intention to acquire TNT in Europe. UPS fourth quarter earnings of 2014 were lower than forecasted due to the e-commerce volatile buying cycle and capacity issues. DHL Deutsche Post continues to perform well as the number one logistics company in the world. Japan Post makes a $5 billion offer for Australia's toll group. And Alibaba bought a stake in Singapore Post. Who's next to buy a post? eBay, Amazon, Alibaba? Click and collect is clearly on the rise. Two thirds of the e-consumers used a click and collect service. Pickup in stores is booming in many countries, meaning less parcels to deliver by the post. Parcel lockers are installed everywhere in almost every country. And parcel boxes at home are popping up in Europe. Will Uber expand their activities and use flexible work staff for parcel deliveries. If this happens, the whole postal industry system is at stake. Will the European Commission eliminate the VAT exemption for the importation of small consignments, the famous 22 euro threshold? What would be the impact of this on the imports from China? Will the e-commerce industry and us survive without access to customer data? a very important topic in the EU related to big data and privacy rules. You see a lot of questions, uncertainties, risks, opportunities on our radar. And this conference is a great opportunity to share clarity, views on the following questions. Can posts leverage their networks in an increasingly volatile global economy? The panel one discussion. Are posts innovative, innovative enough to stay relevant for the consumers? Is there a need for a holistic review of the various delivery models due to the e-commerce growth? Is there a need for Post to change their USP of universal home delivery? Will Post win the battle for the SME customer? Is there a need for more regulation knowing that Post gradually become parcel companies? Is the Postal Universal Service really a driver for social and economic development? How important are postal financial services? Can posts contribute to sustainable development? This UPU World Conference, Conference strategy will help us to find the right answers to all these important industry questions. And I wish you a very interesting and an excellent conference. This session of this afternoon will focus on three different topics with three different panels. First of all, we will discuss the rapidly evolving economic environment, then innovation as the key to success, and last but not least, the e-commerce challenge. Everyone agrees that economic uncertainty can have a significant impact on individual and business behavior, as well as on financial infrastructure. And for the postal business, an economic downturn can accelerate trends, such as the decline of traditional business mail. But it can also trigger opportunities. Panelists will explore these as they survey the legacy of the economic and financial crisis of recent years. Our first speaker, our first panelist is Mr. Lin, director of the Asian Pacific Postal Union Bureau. He has more than 20 years experience in the postal sector, particularly in China. 
Previously, Mr. Lin worked for the State Post Bureau of China as Deputy Director General of the Department of External Affairs and later as the DG of the Media Center. Let's now listen to the views of Mr. Lin on what the postal sector should do to face the economic uncertainties of today. Mr. Lin, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. And thank you very much, my friend, Mr. Soma. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here, not only to attend the meeting, not only to be here as the panelist, especially the first one. And also, I'm really very, very happy with the three key words of our conference, namely, innovative, integrated, and inclusive. Because just the same three words I used as my opening speech for the Asia Pacific Post Executive Committee meeting uh, three weeks before in Pakistan. Now comes the word in my mind Great mind thinks alike. Secondly, I want to share with all of you an example to support my point. You know that in Asia Pacific, we have a post college. We call it APPC, Asia Pacific Post College. By the way, you are all very warmly welcome to send people to us to get very good quality of training. Now I come back. Normally, for the courses that we conducted, I will deliver a presentation at the beginning of the courses. And according to the information that my colleague prepared for me, the first page would be the explanation of English for the word post, P-O-S-T. That means P means puncture, O means overspread, S means safe, and T means trustworthy. I always asked the participant, is that true or not? Especially the puncture, the first, first alphabet with P. And up today, more than half of the participate would say, would answer yes. And then comes the second question. If a letter from Bangkok, because we located in Bangkok, Thailand, we are very happy, <laughs> a letter from Bangkok to Beijing by the post takes five days, or maybe three days. Is that puncture or not? Normally, it's difficult to answer. I said, it was puncture, takes three days, a letter from Bangkok to Tokyo or to Beijing. Maybe it was also puncture by the post took five days because 30 years before, we didn't have any competition. But now, if it takes two days, maybe not puncture. Because another people can do it in one half days, maybe only in one day. The, part, the most of the participate to attend all courses is the middle level in the Asia Pacific. Now comes the key word of my mind is we need change. We need open. Not only open the door, most important is open the mind. Yes, people can say, yes, we changed a lot. We opened a lot. Yes, that's true. But compared to the general economy, compared to another sector, 
not enough. So we should more open, we should more change, we should more focus on the market and customers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lin, for this uh, short and very precise uh, presentation. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Stefan Kracek. He's Associate General Counsel and Head of Government Relations at eBay EMEA, so one of the postal customers here in the room, and that's uh, exceptional and very good. Stefan is French national born in the Netherlands and joined in 2009 eBay, where he now heads eBay's Government Relations team. I look forward to hear his views on the rapid evolving economy and the challenges that brings to eBay and similar global marketplaces. Uh, Stefan, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, and I just wanted to let you know how much of an honor it is as a private sector person here out of the e-commerce world to be in front of this room uh, of what is, to me, the most powerful tool that will change the face of the economy and of commerce in the next 10 years. I think you all and the bodies that you represent in your various countries hold the key to what can become an, e an economic success of inclusiveness in the world economy. And so I'm extremely proud that I am allowed today to share a few of our ideas as eBay with you in the hope that if there is a conference like this uh, in 10 years from now, we can look at a PowerPoint presentation with magnificent growth figures, maybe letters and written posts is going down. But parcel delivery should really, as it already do, uh, does right now, show massive increase. And as a result, inclusion of what we see in particular small and medium-sized players in the world economy. <clears throat> um, I was, of course, also very proud to see the name of eBay uh, uh, numerous times in, in Peter's presentation. And I would like to issue two compliments. First of all, the first um, video that, that we saw for us as one of the pioneers in e-commerce, in, in the online and technology-enabled commerce, the first video really shows that the UPU has focused on exactly the right issues. And of that, innovation is, of course, key. Uh, also, the questions that Peter asked in his various slides, and there were numerous questions, I think were absolutely spot on. eBay uh, this year will celebrate 20 years as an e-commerce platform. And it's good to differentiate us vis-a-vis uh, -vis Amazon, uh, which was also quite prominently there. They are our competitors, so I was not very pleased to see their name appear um, too often. Amazon is more of a retailer. We are a platform. We actually allow people to come together, buyers and sellers, to find each other worldwide. And just to give you an example, in Europe alone, more than 350,000 professional small and medium-sized sellers sell on eBay. And the value of what they are shipping is in the billions and billions of dollars. So the economy of tomorrow, as we see it, and as we have seen it develop over the last 20 years, has a few elements. And I think one was already indicated uh, uh, also in Peter's uh, presentation. Um, are some of the, the pure players online now also opening brick and mortar shops? The future of commerce is a complete blurred landscape where the consumer dictates how, where, and when he will consume. And that means that both the, the, the commercial players, but also the delivery uh, uh, operators will have to adapt to what the consumer dictates. The consumer is completely empowered, and that has really radically changed to what we've seen in the past. The second point is that you will see less and less influence by the big multinational players, and you will see a much bigger role that will be played by the small and medium-sized enterprises, by the one-man person 
that starts a very small business locally in a remote rural area, and I'm sure you've had it, heard it before, the number of success stories is growing. People that lost their jobs started a small business online and now are not only growing, but they're employing people themselves. And I come back to the point I made to you earlier. How can they thrive? By broadband access, but that's not your problem. Um, by having access to a world market. The broadband is there or will be there. The platforms are there. So people selling on eBay, just to take us as an example, they can reach 170, 200 markets in the world. You can find us everywhere. So you can find the sellers everywhere. I come back to the point of you holding the key. It is not being found anymore on internet or on mobile or in the high street. It is actually making sure that that parcel that has been ordered by a buyer in, in Peru from a seller in Sweden actually gets from Sweden to Peru on time in a predictable, transparent manner. And think of yourselves as consumers. You know it better than anyone else because you're both in the business of the postal service and you're a consumer. What would you like most as a consumer when you order something from a remote country? You want to know when your parcel is going to come. You want to know before you push that button, say, yes, I will purchase this from someone I don't know, far away. You want to know how much it will cost you to have that good shipped to your home. And then you want to know when it arrives. So what people really want is predictability. It's not rocket science, they want predictability. So long delivery times, high price levels or strange price levels that are not understandable, neither for small enterprises or for consumers. Those are problems that you can tackle. It is unconceivable that if I send a postal package from Ireland to Poland, knowing that the most expensive part is the last mile, it is significantly more expensive than when I send that very same package from Poland to Ireland even though I know that the last mile in Ireland is more expensive than the last mile in Poland. How is that possible? Where can I find the information to me as a consumer or as an SME that explains why? And so I can take my decision. Um, and just to finish off, and I'll be happy to take many, many questions if time allows later on. Um, eBay sits on a wealth of data. That's one point that Peter also mentioned. Data is absolutely key. And so we're in a luxurious position of studying various markets and the dynamics. So we recently studied Chile, Peru, Ukraine, South Africa, Jordan, Thailand, Indonesia, and India. And what small and medium-sized companies are doing there on the world, the global commerce uh, uh, arena. And we came to a number of very important findings. And this comes back to my point about you holding the key to the future economic development of the small players who will be the core of world trade in the future. Over 95% of the small businesses that we analyzed in those countries um, are engaging in exporting, much more than their brethren who are only stuck to brick and mortar physical shops. Across the eight markets that we analyzed, the average number of international markets that exported reach is between 30 and 40. And 60, and this is a very important point, 60 to 80% of new businesses that started survived their first year when they sold online. And that compares to only 20 to 50 that survive if they don't sell online. So again, it's a super powerful tool, and with an efficient, transparent, and predictable postal service, I think you can make the difference uh, between an economic crisis or an economic success in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. That's an important statement that we as Post have the future in our hands to support the eBay and e-commerce growth going forward over the next uh, 10 years. Our next um, speaker, notre prochain orateur, est Monsieur Moulay Hafid El Alami. Il est ministre de l'Industrie, le Commerce, l'Investissement et l'Économie Digitale avec le gouvernement marocain. 
est une figure bien connue du monde économique et social marocain et passionné de la promotion de l'esprit d'entreprise. Il est un entrepreneur lui-même car il est le président fondateur du groupe Saham, acteur marocain de référence dans des métiers de services à forte valeur ajoutée comme l'assurance santé et immobilier. Suivant Forbes, il est le 38e homme le plus riche d'Afrique, avec une fortune personnelle estimée à 500 millions de dollars. Un homme avec ce bilan est susceptible d'avoir une vision très claire de l'économie mondiale. Monsieur le ministre, la parole est à vous. Merci, cher ami, pour votre présentation. Je suis ravi d'être ici aujourd'hui, un peu intimidé devant les spécialistes du monde de la Poste. Et je ne suis qu'un modeste ministre chargé d'un certain nombre de sujets, dont le secteur postal. Donc, en découvrant euh, ce secteur, nous sommes euh, impressionnés par les changements qui ont été opérés dans le monde et euh, les difficultés auxquelles doivent faire face les différentes postes à travers le monde. Certaines se sont déjà développées et ont avancé très fortement. D'autres sont en train d'essayer de, de, de réaliser cette transformation. Alors, quels sont euh, les enjeux socio-économiques que l'on rencontre souvent D'abord, au niveau de la conjoncture. Nous avons aussi un marché mondial qui a décliné ces dernières années avec une crise qui a frappé tout le monde, y compris... Euh, euh, la Poste par, par ricochet, mais euh, nous avons aussi une, une globalisation qui a totalement modifié le type des échanges entre les individus et les entreprises. Deuxième élément important, c'est cette évolution technologique qui a, euh, comme une brise, effleuré l'ensemble du monde, mais euh, pour certains, elle a été dévastatrice, et en particulier ceux qui ne se sont pas euh, transformés, parce que les générations changeantes, de X à Y puis à Z, euh, les besoins de consommation ont complètement changé et le rôle de la Poste a été transformé complètement. Alors, cette concurrence est-elle très forte en termes de concurrence ou de complémentarité On va passer peut-être à la slide suivante. Merci. Alors, Internet est un formidable réacteur pour la Poste. On pourrait voir le verre à moitié vide ou à moitié plein. Pour ma part, je considère que l'arrivée de ces technologies est un véritable, permettez-moi le terme, booster potentiel pour les différentes postes. En effet, le e-commerce, nous avons vu une démonstration magistrale il y a un instant, avec eBay et bien d'autres qui font que cette transformation du commerce peut être une opportunité formidable pour la Poste, mais le gouvernement, dont je fais partie, ou les gouvernements, avec la transformation des services aux citoyens, avec le e-gov, sont aussi un gisement potentiel énorme. Et je crois qu'on a tendance souvent à oublier un, un facteur essentiel, qui est le rôle unique de la Poste partout. C'est un réseau de confiance. C'est le meilleur réseau de confiance que l'on peut connaître. Anciennement, il gérait la partie physique, depuis peu électronique et le volet financier. Mais à présent et pour le futur, nous sommes dans le e-commerce complètement. Et on y est ou on n'y est pas. Et ce sera totalement binaire. La poste électronique, la poste intelligente et ce réseau mondial que constitue la Poste, à la fois physique et électronique. Et ces atouts extrêmement forts permettent à la Poste d'avoir une position qui, à mon sens, est une position de confiance. Alors, les impacts de ces changements, évidemment, on l'a entendu, la chute du courrier, elle continuera, il ne disparaîtra pas, mais elle continuera de façon inexorable. L'augmentation du colis et de l'express, nous espérons que ça puisse se développer fortement. On a entendu parler de l'impression 3D et qui, au-delà de l'impression euh, des factures, on parle dans des conférences un peu plus... Euh, comment dire J'ai assisté à une conférence avant-gardiste qui m'a 
donné des frissons dans le dos, où on m'expliquait que plus rien ne va circuler dans le monde et que nous allons tout imprimer en 3D, avec des impressions 3D, à domicile pratiquement. Donc je crois que nous poussons un peu le curseur trop loin, nous sommes encore un peu loin de tout cela, restons sur Terre, nous avons encore quelques décennies, voire quelques siècles, à commercer, à transporter des choses entre nous, et nous en avons encore pour un moment avant de voir cette grande technologie arriver. Euh, néanmoins, l'innovation est un élément essentiel qui pourra nous tracer un chemin pour euh, les années à venir, et les pouvoirs publics, les différents pouvoirs publics, s'accrochent comme ils peuvent à cette transformation en profondeur qu'est la Poste. Et à l'instar de ce qui se passe dans le monde, et bien chez nous au Maroc, nous sommes dans la même logique. J'ai rencontré, j'ai eu l'occasion de rencontrer le directeur général de l'UPU, que je salue, et euh, en discutant, euh, j'ai eu des étoiles dans les yeux en regardant ce que font certaines postes dans le monde. Et à ce titre-là, avec euh, l'équipe de la Poste Maroc, nous avons une équipe aguerrie avec une vraie expertise, une vraie expérience, nous avons décidé de monter ensemble, entre l'équipe marocaine et l'UPU, un projet de transformation en profondeur de notre poste. J'ai été euh, touché d'entendre à chaque fois des exemples. On a parlé d'Italie, on a parlé d'un certain nombre de postes dans le monde, et euh, ça a généré en moi une espèce de, allez, disons-le, de jalousie, euh, me conduisant à dire, eh bien, chez nous au Maroc, nous avons envie de faire partie de ce concert mondial de modernisation des postes. Et nous avons ensemble monté un projet assez fort, parce que les équipes y travaillent depuis un moment, pour transformer la poste avec un nouveau modèle. Alors, la poste doit rester en effet compétitive et servir ce qu'elle fait aujourd'hui, mais elle doit continuer à assurer le service universel, mais surtout investir l'espace numérique qui est en train de prendre une part importante, on l'a entendu, 50%, au-delà de 50% pour la majorité des grandes postes, on a entendu quelque chose aussi d'assez surprenant que le Canada a pris une orientation d'éliminer peut-être une partie de, du courrier. Donc tout cela est nécessaire, cette transformation forte est nécessaire pour accompagner le gouvernement pour le développement économique et social du pays. Et le, ce projet a aussi pour objectif de trouver de nouveaux relais de croissance absolument nécessaires pour cette transformation de la Poste. Très rapidement... Le partenariat avec l'UPU, eh bien, j'ai été frappé par l'expérience ou l'expertise des, des équipes, la qualité d'écoute, et je crois que c'est important que vous ayez un témoignage de quelqu'un d'externe, qui n'est pas nécessairement dans la famille de la Poste, pour vous dire euh, la richesse que l'on peut trouver dans cette grande famille postale mondiale. Il y a vraiment de, et de l'information, et du savoir, et du partage potentiel, on a l'impression d'être dans une famille avec un vrai engagement et une vraie technicité. Tout cela pour le grand bonheur d'une transformation de nos postes pour atteindre cette modernité ô combien nécessaire. Un dernier mot, c'est transformation. Cette slide est trop complexe, mais en deux mots. Cette transformation doit passer nos postes de situation parfois délicate parce qu'elles se sentent agressées par l'arrivée de modernité à une poste qui se positionne sur un surf et qui prend, et qui prend le vent de cette modernité pour pouvoir euh, at atteindre les cieux que nous souhaitons. Mais j'ai grande confiance avec cette confiance que nos populations ont envers la poste de pouvoir faire de nos postes des véritables véhicules pour l'avenir. Et je vous remercie. Monsieur le Ministre, our last speaker of this session before we start a panel discussion is Mr. Dmitry Strashnov. He's a Russian businessman and now the General Director of the Russian Post since 2013. Before he joined the Russian Post, Dmitry was CEO of Tele2 Russia and CEO of Philips Consumer Electronics Russia. No doubt that Russia, the world's eighth largest economy has an impact on the world economy and for sure the issues of the last year have an impact on the Russian economy and the global economy. Interestingly, we have a high-ranked Russian businessman amongst us to comment on this. 
Remitri, happy to hear your views on the economy and the ambition of Russian Post to move away from subsidies into a self-sustaining postal business. Please welcome Dimitri Strasnov. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the way we were moving back and forth, I mean speakers on, on, the, on the stage, reminds me of the very old postal logistics which I faced uh, two years ago in Russia. So. I think one uh, wireless mic would solve the issue and then we would be much freely to, to deliver speeches. But uh, uh, nevertheless, I think uh, it's very uh, honored to be at this stage and, uh, and uh, share my views on the challenges we are all facing nowadays uh, in the postal industry. Uh, uh, I would really start with, uh, with uh, very bold uh, statement. There is no, there is no magic recipes. I mean, uh, there were a lot of questions today: how to survive, how to overcome, how to sustain, uh, how to defend your space. So basically, uh, the recipe is very simple. I mean, you have to be efficient. You have to be efficient in logistics, moving parcels, moving letters. You have to meet uh, the customer expectations. Today is even more important to to do a lot of changes in the level of mindset, understanding the customer needs. Do we need to deliver all the parcels in one day or two days? Would be customer satisfied having three or five days delivery, but with a high predictability level? So can we deliver on promise? Can we deliver in five days if we promise five days? I think this is getting more and more important today because the cost of five-day delivery is in times lower than one day. And uh, in our environment today, where we have huge challenges from the markets, uh, when the financial situation is unstable, we need to count each and every penny. And by the way, today, when uh, the crisis is uh, all around, what are customers thinking about? And what are they start doing when they were not doing uh, in the good times? We start counting money. So if you can deliver in time and you can do it cheaper, we go to you. And I think the postal operators has enormous opportunity in, uh, in a turbulent times to even win the markets. Because you know that uh, a lot of the uh, companies focusing on express deliveries, well, pretty costly uh, high-level services, are really getting, uh, getting, getting problems. And they're struggling to postal services is more efficient in this way. And especially in Russia, because uh, we have an infrastructure which is across the country. Uh, it's uh, 42,000 uh, uh, post offices. Uh, there's a huge, I mean, uh, logistic infrastructure. And here we have our benefits compared to any other companies. Uh, well, basically, uh, there were many words said about the trends of today, and I think uh, uh, as we are present in all the segments in, uh, in, in the mail services, in, the, in, a, in a box delivery or parcel deliveries, as well as the uh, financial services, we have, to, we have to be, again, pragmatic. And uh, proactivity is also uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, elements of recipe. Uh, leading in online uh, shifting mails and direction is, is, is a key. So we should not be followers. We should create new products. We should really lead in moving, uh, in moving letters to online. Uh, we become, uh, become a major partner, major carrier for e-commerce. That's, uh, that's also pretty clear. So how to, how to be a reliable partner, how to really meet uh, the customer expectations. I think uh, we all knew how to make it. And uh, financial services, last but not least. Uh, there are many, many postal administrations uh, having chances to provide the basic banking services. So the uh, Russian Post is still at the stage where we are not able to do that. But uh, uh, with coming changes, and especially in the postal law uh, of Russia, so we expect to do uh, the new version of postal law uh, since, uh, well, it's, it's going to be a new version since 15 years. And uh, getting Russian Post uh, joint stock company, so we will be able to provide the basic, uh, I hope we will be able to provide the basic financial services. Um, 
and I think it's uh, also an important element which is uh, worth to mention. So the, all the postal operators, uh, uh, all the postal administrations in the countries, they do maintain the so social responsibility. And um, this is not only uh, keeping, the, uh, keeping uh, the postal offices all around the, the country to, to provide the uh, access to the population from the government side and, and, and provide the chance to, to communicate to each other, but also uh, uh, taking the financial sector, uh, it's, it's also solving the issues for end bank population. Well, in different countries, the, the, the penetration of the bank accounts is different, but in Russia, we're slightly above 50%. It's only postal offices and post or postal bank can solve this issue. So we can really bring the basic financial services to each and every citizen in the country. Well, uh, again, uh, to, to finish, actually, I would like to say that uh, uh, once more we have to focus on efficiency. Uh, we have to rethink the basic uh, processes. Uh, we need to look uh, at infrastructure. We need to look at the last mile. Uh, the consumers are getting more demanding, and actually they are getting younger. Uh, well, the more ambitious, they, they are really focusing on the uh, uh, efficiency in terms of spending. Uh, and I think, well, all of us is capable to, to address uh, this challenge. I wish all of our success and uh, again, uh, good working days and believe we'll have some more discussions uh, also offline uh, after the session because uh, I would be very interested to, uh, to get uh, your comments and your expertise as well as to share our experience. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dimitri, for these interesting views on uh, the Russian postal business and the economy in general. Um, now we'll have a first session with some Q&A amongst the panelists. And uh, I always was uh, learned that customers should come first. So I'll start with the customer in the room, and that's eBay. Yeah? So I have two questions for eBay. You have here the majority of your postal suppliers in the room. What is the one thing which comes into your mind that they need to change tomorrow to support better your service and your business? Oh, I had a longer list, but... You only uh, have one. <laughs> only have one. <laughs> I th uh, it comes back to my example just uh, before. Price, transparency, and predictability. Okay. I just slipped in the second one. But it's the predictability, and uh, I would like Predictability, to let me come back to that. What yeah. do you want that we as postal companies deliver? You want to know it's delivered in three days, or is it delivered on a certain day? Because that's a big difference. Yeah. What do you want? Um, I want a certain day. A certain day. And if I may, just quickly link to what Dimitri said, uh, which is... I'm happy to pay less and wait longer as long as I know exactly when the parcel arrives. And or pay more and... You're happy to pay more when we do what? When it arrives quicker. If I really need it. If I want okay. to have my Apple iWatch so. that's coming up tomorrow to yes. flash to my friends or my wedding dress, which really needs to be there on Friday... I don't Friday, want to see you in a wedding no. dress, but... <laughs> I'm happy to pay more. Okay, so, so price related to speed, that's what yeah. you want, and yeah. price predictability. Second question for eBay, when are you going to buy a post? Amazon is buying posts all over the globe, when is eBay going to buy a post? No, ne I, no never say never. Probably not. What we will do, what many, many people will be doing more and more, is be intermediary between the customer and the service providers like the post, and try to group be all those thousands of SMEs that de de depend on eBay and, and, and make deals as an intermediary with the it post. It was a little bit of a joke, the question, but maybe it's not. But let me go into that. Will eBay also start to develop their own last mile delivery services? Is that something which is on your map? It is like everything else in e-commerce is being considered, 
as I know, as things stand, it is commercially very difficult to make viable. So we feel for all of you because we know how how difficult that last mile is and how expensive. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Difficulty in the last mile brings me to my next question is about profitability of posts. Yeah? We see in Western Europe that the posts make high profits, sometimes very high profits. In other countries, there's no profit at all or loss making. What's the view of, and I would say, the postal guys in this area? You, may, you can also comment on that eBay, but uh, what's the view on the profitability of post in general and maybe in your country and then link to that because link to profit is investment uh, investment um, strategy do the post invest enough do they have enough money and link to profitability may i start with you dimitri on that well uh, can we have microphone yes yeah it works uh, i think uh, as we said today, is that post, uh, we, 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 shift, we, we are actually trying to do the business. So we have to compete in, in a very uh, tough segments with uh, a lot of commercial companies. Uh, so without efficiency, we, we cannot survive. So the efficiency means that we have to be uh, able to maintain profitability. We have to generate cash and we have to invest into the infrastructure, new products uh, and our stuff. Uh, which is challenging because, again, as the post is, is, is a package. It's not only the, the today in most countries, it's not only the uh, express deliveries which are most profitable. Is, is Russian Post today a profitable company? Uh, yeah, well, the, we just announced the last year results, so we became profitable first time in five years. Uh, though um, we have a lot of things to, to be solved, so we don't have, as, as I mentioned already, we don't have um, uh, banking services. And I think this is one of the key drivers for profitability uh, across the postal administrations. Um, so we, we have to look at all three components. So the, uh, can we be profitable everywhere? Probably not. Uh, in financial services, yes, sure. In, uh, in parcels, yes, we have to. We have to compete to the expressors. In, uh, in letters, well, if you find some solutions, uh, if, we, if we optimize the costs, if we, if we start leading shift to online, why not? So I don't see any, any kind of areas where uh, you cannot be profitable as a pure business. The elements of the, uh, well, the social elements which we have is like uh, carrying on the, uh, or maintaining the, uh, the waste uh, uh, network, vast net network of the uh, postal offices across the country. This is something which is costly. And uh, here's the question, so do we able to fill them with the services required and do, do, do they generate profit or we have to really kind of recover those costs? Okay, uh, thank you very right? much. Monsieur le Ministre, votre vue sur uh, l'investissement, la rentabilité des postes en général, mais aussi en, en Maroc? Je pense qu'il y, y a deux volets assez distincts. Il y a les, la poste traditionnelle uh, qui a un, un service universel qui n'est pas nécessairement ou qui n'est pas obligatoirement euh, rentable, qui ne doit pas être obligatoirement rentable, parce qu'il doit rendre un service, et là l'État, son rôle est d'accompagner. Mais il y a un deuxième volet, et que l'on voit fleurir ces, ces dernières années, c'est toute la partie service euh, à valeur ajoutée de la Poste, et on commence à percevoir des capacités assez importantes d'apporter un service euh, fondamental, que ce soit du e-commerce ou, ou autre. Euh, et la Poste, de, de mon point de vue, est vouée à continuer à être rentable pour les prochaines années, pour autant que les opérateurs se mettent dans, dans la vague de la modernisation. Ils sont rentables aujourd'hui Ils sont rentables aujourd'hui. De ce que l'on perçoit, ils sont encore rentables aujourd'hui. Très bien, ça va. Um, Mr. Lin, your view on postal profitability and investments? Oh, it's very difficult to explain. How to say? <clears throat> I think uh, for the UPU members, we have really very, very different situation. So uh, it's difficult to, to say in one word it should be or uh, shouldn't be. Depends on the different situation, depends on the different culture, different economy, different geographic situation. It's, 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 
it's difficult. For some countries, it's, how to say, it's relatively easy to get the purpose to achieve. But uh, in general, it, it, is, it is difficult. The majority of your members in the APPU, are they profitable or loss-making? You know that? Can you share that with us? Uh, you know, we have almost uh, the most different uh, members than any other restricted unions in the world. We have 32 members. We have a huge member like uh, China, India, with 1.3 or 1.1 billion population. But we have also Pacific countries with only 10,000, 20,000 people. But uh, uh, in general, we can see in Asia Pacific, uh, 50, around 50 to 50. Okay, thank you for that. I have a question related, again for Dimitri, related on the economy and the global economy. We had last year, without making any political statements here, the sanctions toward Russia. Uh, did that impact you as a postal business? Because I know that a lot of uh, import is coming into your country, for example, from China. China, Russia was booming, big, big business. Did you saw an impact due to the EU and other sanctions? Uh, well, it's entirely political questions, so, and then I have to be very smart to answer this question. Uh, I have to say, uh, we, uh, the sanctions as such was not impacting us negatively. And uh, the reason is that the, uh, the, the volumes, import volumes from, you know, from online uh, shops, uh, e-commerce uh, traders, uh, they were increasing and they still keep increasing. So China is getting a uh, bigger and bigger share. So I think we, we might see that uh, slight decrease, uh, decrease of supplies from the Europe and the United States, but not, not, not because of the sanctions, because the, the average uh, price per, per pack is, is much higher from the Europe than from China. Uh, a huge number of the uh, small packets from Asia, and it's uh, in the skip going. Let's keep going. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll open now um, questions uh, from the floor, but first of all, there's an intervention from Tunisia. I don't know where Tunisia is for the moment. They want to make an intervention. Tunisia is over there. You have the floor. Please uh, mention your name, who you are, and be very short in your question or comment. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Moderateur. C'est Madame Hayet Nayel, directeur de la stratégie de la Poste tunisienne. Je tiens tout d'abord à vous présenter les excuses de la délégation tunisienne pour l'absence de Monsieur Nabil El Madeni, ancien président directeur général de la Poste tunisienne, qui a récemment été appelé à d'autres fonctions. Je tiens aussi à vous remercier d'avoir accordé la parole à la Tunisie pour vous exposer l'expérience et la stratégie de la poste tunisienne pour faire face à l'évolution rapide de l'environnement économique. La stratégie de la poste tunisienne s'inscrit dans le cadre de la stratégie de Dauha et la stratégie du ministère de la Technologie, de la Communication et de l'économie numérique Tunisie Digitale 2018, dont les principaux axes sont garantir l'inclusion sociale et réduire la fracture numérique, évoluer vers une e-administration, renforcer la culture numérique et stimuler l'innovation dans le domaine des postes et d'éthique. La Poste tunisienne a pris conscience des avantages offerts par l'éthique pour élargir sa gamme de produits via les différents canaux, le physique, les brides et l'électronique, avec une meilleure qualité de service et plus, une plus grande inclusion. A cet effet, pour être active en matière d'inclusion financière, la Poste tunisienne a réussi à mettre en place le produit de porte-monnaie électronique, le e qui a permis la bancarisation de plus de 500 000 citoyens à travers des comptes virtuels. Ces comptes ont permis le développement des services via mobile afin de fidéliser les clients de la Poste, rationaliser la gestion des fonds par la diminution de la circulation du cash et la décongestion des guichets de la Poste. Ainsi, les services mobiles permettent le paiement des factures, l'encaissement des mandats, le virement de compte à compte et le recouvrement des créances des institutions de microfinance en Tunisie. 
et en se basant sur les progrès réalisés en matière de paiement électronique et de logistique postale, la Poste tunisienne offre un service intégré de e-commerce qui est composé de quatre éléments, à savoir un kit logistique, un kit paiement, un back-office commerçant et un service de recouvrement à distance. Par ailleurs, et profitant de l'image de la Poste en tant que tiers de confiance, elle a été choisie par le ministère du Commerce comme partenaire stratégique dans le projet national e-retail. Ce projet vise la mise en place d'une plateforme B2B pour dématérialiser les transactions commerciales et assurer une traçabilité des produits échangés. Excusez-moi de vous interrompre, mais est-ce que vous finalisez Ok, ce... d'accord, d'accord, c'est bon, c'est fini. La Poste tunisienne de demain sera un partenaire privilégié en matière de logistique et de développement de la convergence numérique et physique grâce à son positionnement en tant que tiers de confiance des citoyens, des entreprises et du gouvernement. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. D'accord, merci. merci bien. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions, d'autres commentaires L'Égypte demande la parole. Égypte, vous avez la parole. Merci pour vos, les interventions intéressantes pour le matin. Je suis Rada Labib, vice-ministre de la télécommunication en Égypte. J'ai une toute petite question euh, par rapport à comment la Poste euh, aide à limiter l'utilisation du cash. D'accord. C'est tout. J'espère qu'à la fin de la journée, ou peut-être demain, avoir une réponse. Merci. C'est une question concernant l'argent. Je vais donner la parole au ministre qui euh, a une expérience avec ça, à mon avis. Enfin, pas une expérience de cash euh, <rire> dans, dans le secteur euh, euh, de la poste. Néanmoins, euh, tout ce qui permet dans le secteur à la fois bancaire, tout le secteur financier, de dématérialiser le cash avec des cartes de crédit, avec des cartes prépayées, etc., évite la circulation de cash. Et j'imagine que vous avez les mêmes problèmes que tous les pays en, en émergence. Hein, pour euh, la gestion du cash, la, la bancarisation est un élément essentiel et c'est le terreau qui permet d'éviter la circulation, enfin de limiter la circulation du cash. En tout cas, le, le, le vécu marocain a été une accélération de la bancarisation qui a pu faire baisser totalement la, la circulation du cash et le secteur postal. Pour le Maroc, il a une filiale bancaire, donc dans ce cadre-là, ça permet une baisse, mais toute l'arrivée la, de la technologie est une belle orientation pour limiter la circulation du cash. Ça va. Question très intéressante. Demain, il y a une session qui va spécifiquement euh, aller plus loin dans le réseau financier, les aspects financiers des euh, sociétés postales. Euh, merci bien. Est-ce qu'il y a encore d'autres questions, d'autres interventions, d'autres questions, d'autres remarques from the floor? OK. I can't see. There is one over there, but I can't read it from here. Um, I think it's Bena. Bena? Ok, Bena, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, merci aux modérateurs et félicitations à l'ensemble des pénalistes et des panélistes. Je suis Martin Wilfried de l'autorité de régulation du Bénin. Je suis resté un peu sur ma fin quant à la question posée par le modérateur sur la rentabilité des postes. Deuxième question, je souhaiterais poser, que je souhaiterais poser au ministre marocain. Dans le modèle euh, impressionnant qui nous a été présenté, euh, j'ai quelques inquiétudes, dans la mesure où je n'ai pas perçu le rôle des régulateurs. N'oublions pas que le thème de ce panel, c'est agir collectivement et distribuer à l'échelle mondiale. Quel rôle réservez-vous à l'autorité de régulation dans ce nouveau modèle que vous voulez construire au Maroc Merci. Monsieur le ministre, vous pouvez répondre à ces questions pertinentes Merci pour votre question. En effet, tous les régulateurs ont un réflexe naturel. Hein Et je l'entends, le, je, je le comprends. Ceci dit, pour la, pour la Poste, nous n'avons pas aujourd'hui structuré cette partie régulation. Elle ne se porte pas trop mal. Nous en discutons avec des, un potentiel de transformer cette régulation vers l'ANRT, c'est l'Agence de Régulation des Télécommunications. 
Alors, il y a une complication, c'est qu'elle a une banque, et cette banque relève d'un régulateur qui est le secteur financier. Donc, c'est un sujet, en effet, très complexe. La régulation est fondamentale dans tous les secteurs et dans tous les pays, et, et j'en conviens. Euh, mais pour que la régulation fonctionne, il faut que le sous-jacent fonctionne correctement. Nous avons besoin, d'abord, que nos postes soient aux normes internationales les plus avancées aujourd'hui, euh, en, en gardant un, une, euh, comment dire, à l'esprit que nous y viendrons à la régulation. Dès que les transactions se passent et que les flux sont importants, la régulation arrive. Mais il est essentiel que nos activités, avant la régulation, soient fondamentales. Et moi, je dirais, faites attention à ce que les régulateurs ne deviennent pas castrateurs. La régulation dépend de moi, dépend de mon département, par exemple de, des télécoms, et, et je crois que nous avons tendance parfois à trop vouloir réguler par brider ou tuer des secteurs. Il faut en être, euh, il faut en être conscient. I see eBay mentioning something on the regulator side. You uh, yeah. agree on what has been said before. You want to comment on that? Yes, uh, please totally. go ahead. Because I think this is a very refreshing uh, point of view that we would like to subscribe to. Um, and, and what we say as a private sector player to the regulators is we're not telling you don't regulate us or don't regulate the sector. But what we're asking you to do is take an innovative approach to regulation, which is a pragmatic one. And what you will see is that what you try to regulate today doesn't look the same in a year from now, and your regulation or your regulatory environment will be outdated before it's actually enacted. And what we call on you is to take a more open-minded, framework-type, flexible regulatory approach, for which there's obviously a role to play for regulators, but one in which they can adapt as technology progresses. And as we've seen on various presentations here, it progresses extremely fast. And I think that's what the, the term castratrice um, uh, kind of like could refer to, is don't become an obstacle, but become an enabler as a regulator. And that's perfectly possible if you regulate in the same way as computer program developers actually develop their new programs and their new products. Okay, thank you very much for that. Regulators don't become an obstacle. That's what they say here. I think that's interesting viewpoint for the discussion tomorrow on regulation. Um, there were more questions from the floor. I think somewhere over, yeah. Uh, Iraq, Iraq is asking the floor. Iraq, you have the floor. Thank <laughs> أشكركم على هذه المداخلات المداخلة اللي تفضل بها السيد وزير الاتصالات من من المملكة المغربية حبيت أن أتداخل على هذا الموضوع هنالك تحديات حديثة في التكنولوجيا الاتصالاتية وخصوصا نحن في العراق نمتلك شبكة شبكة اتصالات ضوئية انفراستراكشر هذه شبكة كبيرة جدا لأن العراق يمتلك دول عديدة من دول الجوار توزيع هذه الساعات الآن هناك دراسة في البريد العراقي وفي وزارة الاتصالات العراقية أن يتم توزيع هذه الساعات عن طريق البريد العراقي ضمن آلية تكنولوجية محددة ولكننا حقيقة لاقينا بعض الصعوبات عن طريق توزيع هذه الساعات هذه تكنولوجيا حديثة أردنا أن ندخلها إلى البريد العراقي وأن يكون هو المسيطر الرئيس لتعظيم الموارد للبريد العراقي ولكي يتم تعميمها على بقية الأعضاء في الاتحاد البريد العالمي وحقيقة واجهنا تحدي آخر هو الساعات الكارير عندما نستورد هذه الساعات من خارج البلد حقيقة واجهنا تحدي آخر هنالك تعبير لهذه الساعات خارج عن القانون وبدأنا بدراسة وتجارب أن نسيطر عليها عن طريق البريد العراقي هذه دراسة كبيرة جدا ومن المحتمل أن نتعاون مع بقية البلدان التي لديها هذا البرنامج شكرا لإصغائكم
يا جواب من السيد وزير الاتصال Sorry, I missed that last part. Monsieur le ministre, vous pouvez répondre à ce question ou ce... Je, je voulais vous remercier pour, pour euh, votre intervention. En effet, nous avons tous à traverser des, cette transformation à différents, à différents niveaux. Et ce qui est important, c'est de pouvoir, sur ces sujets-là, avoir un vrai partage au niveau, euh, au niveau universel, à travers l'UPU et aussi en direct. Sachez que vous êtes les bienvenus. Toute notre modeste connaissance, et je vous le dis tout de suite, elle est modeste. Quand je regarde ce qui s'est passé à travers le monde, nous avons encore beaucoup de choses à apprendre. Mais nous avons fait un chemin jusqu'à présent qui est à votre entière disposition. Quand vous voulez, je suis disposé à vous recevoir avec les équipes et partager ensemble notre, notre expérience. Nous avons, tenté, nous avons tenté des choses qui ont donné de beaux résultats, d'autres qui n'ont pas été exceptionnel, et dès que vous utilisez le réseau de la Poste, évidemment les autres réseaux euh, se dressent face à vous en disant comment pouvez-vous orienter vers la Poste des flux, mais euh, je suis à votre disposition pour partager toute cette expérience et voir qu'est-ce que nous pouvons en tirer comme, comme leçon euh, et à partager. Ok, grand merci. Il y a encore une question de Ouganda. Ouganda, vous avez la parole. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, the person who wanted to speak was Panama. So, no question from Uganda. There was another one. Some... Nigeria. Okay, Nigeria, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, for giving me the floor. I quickly want to share a little experience on this email uh, e-commerce uh, product. Uh, most of the cross-border e-commerce products come received in Nigeria come through our sister designated operators. And when they do come, they come in form of small letters, small packets and they are not registered. Most of them are not registered. And they contain valuables. So on arrival, they have to be given special treatment. If they are to be delivered as ordinary letter post, those items may be, the security of those items may be endangered because they contain some, they contain attractive uh, valuables. So in the process of giving special, special treatment to those items, our administration charge what we call handling charges. And this is resisted by many of, or some of the, uh, the e-commerce the e uh, uh, addressees who claim that they have already paid for the delivery and could not pay any other extra costs. So the point I'm trying to make is that um, these e-commerce items contain valuables, and therefore they cannot be delivered as ordinary letters. And if they are to be given special treatment like EMS or like parcel, it will attract additional costs. And the e-tailers want uh, asking for a very cheap cost of delivery. I do not know if they take this into, into consideration. In okay, so, so what's your question then? Yeah. And I think the question is for eBay. Yeah, to, they to, charge you too much? Yes, the e eBay or any of the, any of the uh, private sector uh, player in the e-commerce uh, uh, a business. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the intervention. You want? We we charge nothing. I mean, no, no, we're, we're we're innocent. Um, so <laughs> that's good to hear. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure what role eBay c can play here, but but uh, I would want to say is that uh, as a platform, a third-party platform. It's the responsibility of the buyer and the seller, and in this case, the seller, 
to fill out forms correctly, to be transparent also from their end on what, what the good is that is being sent. And I come back to my point about predictability and transparency. If there are extra costs involved because the product that's being shipped is of a certain value and needs a special treatment by postal services, then that should be visible uh, when the transaction is made so that the consumer actually knows what that an extra uh, cost is, is going to be paid. It's all about transparency. As long as people know in advance and they accept, there should be no problem in my view. Thank you very much. Dimitri, you want to comment on that? I just want to add a few words, and as far as I understood, the, the issue is that uh, uh, the number of the small packets uh, uh, from uh, e-commerce is increasing, actually, those packets, including the valuable goods. And uh, there are certain requirements in several, several countries, and by the way, in Russia as well, all the small packets has to be registered. So it makes uh, the small packets, are, well, pretty costly or at least uh, um, the process, I mean, it takes, it takes I mean, a certain additional uh, procedures and it, it, makes, it makes additional cost. Uh, I think it's a more internal, internal question for UPU uh, related to tariffs because, well, if you're importing these goods, so basically at the end of the period you, you, get, you get compensation and uh, if the uh, sender sends those small packets uh, as unregistered and you have to register, so you carry your cost yourself. Um, so I think it's it's more more a kind of internal discussion Thank you. among. So more the, work to be done by the UPU. They're all so. here. The IP so. is here. I think so it's a pretty hot topic take note for of many, your many countries. Yeah. Mark. Good. Thank you very much. Um, with this, I want to close this first session, and I want to thank our excellent speakers to give their views on these topics and, and answer to sometimes difficult questions. So please give them a hand. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Uh, you can leave the platform. And in the meantime, I want to ask the panelists of the second discussion, which will go on innovation, uh, to come on stage. And that Mr. Botan Sebeni, Dr. Benton, Philip Metzger, and Professor Kalamu Kalamula Ramli. Please come on stage. Can I help you? Sorry. You have a business card there. Want die is echt. Alsjeblieft. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Tot ziens. Bonjour. Enchanté. Mijn micro is al klaar. So what order do we run the same again? So yes, same yes, please, yes, please, yes, yes. So, it's so it's first uh, it's 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 Boton, then Dr. Benton, Metzger Benton. and Ramley. Benton. Okay. Oh. Boton, you're sitting first. Thank you. This man is going to give you the seating order. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I'm Ramli. You're Professor Ramli. Sorry yes. for the pronunciation. Oh, no problem. My microphone is still. They all go out for a break. I wait two minutes or we continue? No, continue. If we've, I think we're getting too long, they start disappearing. So. Yeah, good. Yeah. You have a microphone. Okay, they don't microphones. I, we start. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon again. We continue with the second panel discussion on innovation. And innovation has always been a part of the fabric of public postal services, which has been around for centuries. But as the global environment is changing, there is a need to innovative, 
faster and better? What must POST do to be at the cutting edge? How can better integration be achieved between different types of postal services? Must developing countries invest in new technologies before strengthening their core services? Panelists will explore what POST must do to be as relevant as ever in today's competitive communication market, looking at the lessons learned from other sectors. And our first speaker for this second panel on innovation is Botan Sebeni. He's the Secretary General of POST Europe. Prior to his post ro Europe role, Botant worked for Magia Posta in Hungary, in which he held the post of Executive Director of International Business, and he was a member of the Executive Committee. I'm eager to listen what Botant has to explain to us on post Europe and the innovation trends he sees in Europe and amongst his members. Botant, you have the floor. So thank you, Peter, for the kind introductory words. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As already all the speakers underlined, it is a privilege for me to be here with you. Actually, uh, I'm returning onto this stage after seven years at the 2008 Geneva Congress. I already had the possibility to hold a speech. Uh, that was about another topic, about the financing of the Universal Postal Union, which is still, I guess, an important uh, topic uh, for the UPU. So my role is here uh, today to give you a snapshot about the innovative mindset that characterizes the European postal industry and to position Post Europe as the Association of the European Public Postal Operators in this uh, arena. So I do not want to go into the details of describing uh, Post Europe. I just underline that we are an operators association of all the European uh, Union and non-European uh, Union universal service providers from uh, the whole geographical Europe with uh, splendid uh, figures characterizing the physical uh, delivery, uh, collection, and retail network that we are very proud of. Uh, some basic uh, characteristics of our industry, uh, probably uh, it doesn't contain, this slide doesn't contain any new information as you have seen already, uh, some uh, very good background uh, items, very good uh, background dimensions uh, describing the uh, postal industry development by Peter Sommers. So declining mail volumes, uh, high legacy cost, including the universal service obligation, e-substitution, and the increasing competition, especially related to the parcel market. Another uh, main uh, development uh, that is important in our industry is the change in the paradigm, uh, the change in the DNA of the postal sector. Uh, we definitely see uh, this dynamic here uh, in Europe, which is practically the, swift, uh, the switch uh, from the traditional push model to the pull model. In the past, the client, the uh, e-seller, uh, or uh, the big accounts, uh, the utilities, the banks, financial services, telecoms, were the kings, they were uh, the owners of the transactions while the addresses played a rather passive role. And this has changed. We are changing to a push and pull model where the consumers, as we could hear also in the presentation uh, of eBay, uh, have become uh, the owners of the transactions. They are pushing the button on the computer, they are launching uh, the transaction, they are setting the parameters, and they create uh, for themselves the expectations. And the e-retailers and the delivery partners have to cope with these parameters set by the consumers, have to cope with these uh, expectations, which is a special challenge uh, for our industry. Something special also in Europe, as we see, currently as an emerging trend, the privatization of uh, some of the postal operators, 
currently, uh, within the European Union, uh, we see seven postal operators fully or private, uh, partially in private hand, and uh, we can also add to these two, three other possible uh, transactions of similar type that are in the uh, pipeline and that might be uh, confirmed in the coming uh, period. And then let us see what the postal operators uh, can do in this context. We have uh, a unique know-how and we have some key strengths, parameters that we can uh, leverage on. We have a very long uh, tradition. We have the largest physical retail and delivery network. Uh, we are the, um, uh, uh, the biggest or among the biggest employers in every country or in most of the countries. An immense portfolio diversification has happened in the recent uh, period, including also in some cases a geographical diversification. And again, in most of the countries, we are the trusted partners. And last but not least, we can also add that uh, in a number of countries, in a significant number of countries, the postal operators are in a relatively good financial uh, health. A case study of the uh, cooperation taking into account uh, these uh, parameters is the Postal Industry Initiative uh, on e-commerce, an innovative approach uh, in Europe based on the market forces, based on the market needs, but not forgetting uh, the European Commission drive uh, either. The European uh, uh, Postal Operators Industry Initiative on e-commerce is about addressing some key features of the delivery uh, parameters of the postal operators and the delivery capabilities of uh, the postal operators. You can see on the slide uh, some uh, key features of this type. And here I would like to underline uh, the engine role of the International uh, Post uh, Corporation that is managing the uh, e-commerce interconnect uh, program. And we can also mention in this context that uh, there are talks within uh, 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 this arena between uh, IPC and UPU also to align as much as possible uh, the interconnect program with the ECOMPRO of uh, UPU. So, Taking into account all these uh, uh, development uh, uh, items, uh, the innovative mindset that is available in Europe, we see an emerging uh, innovative uh, business uh, portfolio into our uh, landscape. Postal operators are innovative uh, in the letter mail area, in the parcel area, uh, diversifying into the financial services, logistics, mobile telephony, uh, e-government uh, services. This is a very positive trend. We have to underline that uh, we have to keep, even when being innovative, uh, both feet on the ground. First, we have to defend the core as much as possible and then also to deal uh, with the growth opportunities. And in this context, Post-Europe as an industry association can indeed play an, a role uh, through uh, best practice exchange, know-how exchange, common uh, development uh, activities, not only uh, within the European Union, but also beyond the boundaries of the European Union. We have recently launched a program called Post-Europe Neighborhood uh, programming also in cooperation uh, with uh, UPU to address the specific needs of the Eastern and South and Eastern uh, European uh, operators. So all in all, we can say that the European postal industry is a, a dynamic industry with a lot of uh, growth opportunities and also building on our core uh, capabilities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bothond. Uh, we move on to the next speaker, who is um, uh, Dr. Benton. He will share his views on innovation with us. Uh, Dr. Benton is CEO and President of Saudi Post. He led the restructuring of Saudi Post and the modernization of postal services in Saudi Arabia and has a great contribution on the industry uh, at the global level. Now, Dr. Benton has the right organizational skills is a certainty due to the fact that before he joined Saudi Post, he was a deputy minister of Hajj and Umrah affairs, 
where he deployed a successful e-government project that serves over 5 million Muslims who visit Saudi Arabia annually to perform Hajj and Umrah. Dr. Bentham will explain us the key success factors of using technology to facilitate new solutions and product innovation at Saudi Post and will share his views on regional cooperation. Dr. Benton, the floor Thank is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, let me start by just looking at the mission of the Post. And I think uh, I've heard uh, a lot about the change in DNA of the Post and the changing trends, and I'm going to prove that's not. I think the basic mission was to deliver letters, but we have three dimensions to work on. One is the size. So we deliver from letter, we may go to parcels, and we may go to boxes, and we may go to full containers. So this is one dimension. The other dimension is the time to deliver, whether it is tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, five days, 10 days. And then the third dimension is really from where and to where. So it's a distance. Where do we pick up? Or should the customer come to the office? And where do we deliver? Is it within our territory or somewhere else? I think looking at these three dimensions, really, this is what will take us to the future. To be able to do this as post, we have to invest, to invest in a lot of infrastructure. Even to do this simple letter delivery or parcel delivery or express delivery, most of the posts, and whether it is companies or administrations or corporates, have invested a lot and built a lot of networks. For example, these are the networks which are the necessary ingredients of any successful postal operator. You need a transportation network so that you could move your stuff, maybe from offices to centers to other cities, and you need local uh, delivery network, really the, the last mile delivery. You also need some offices where you can serve your customers who come into your office. And of course, you invest a lot in technology where you want to be able to track and know what, what, what is happening in your organization. So building those four networks, I think, will give you the opportunity to expand in any of the three dimensions that I mentioned earlier. Also, will give you a chance to exploit some of the uh, capabilities that you have gained by building these efficient networks, especially the computer networks that you have built. And of course, we're always proud of our postmen and women, which is the fifth network that we have. So I'm going to show how do we utilize, how do, how do we utilize these networks to innovate and to succeed and to make more money and to help our people. Now, I always have this slide and I look at it as the consumer world. Well, the world is changing. We know that three and four and five years old kids now have iPads and iPhones. So these are our new consumer. It's not me and you and and, and the people that we used to know before. Also, we know that people who go and the labor that work now, they go back home and they open their computers and use Skype and Tango and other means to communicate with their families. They don't send letters anymore. If you look at the caricatures down, you see somebody who's calling the pizza house, said, can you send me the pizza as an attachment if I give you my email? So this is the way the people are thinking. And then that little girl asking for her password because her mother only gave her the name and not the password. And that little boy is, is wondering why God gave us five fingers and not two because the mouse, this is what he needs in life, has got only two buttons. And finally, the guy doesn't know anything except his email address. And I think if we look at our networks, at our capability, at our consumers, we really could serve them well, and we could find the right products at the right time for the right people. This is e-commerce, which everybody has been talking about. We tend that Saudi Post look at e-commerce as only four components. It's store management, cons I mean, uh, customer management, payment management, and delivery. Now, 
uh, I think if we ask uh, the people at eBay or Amazon or Alibaba or anybody who is doing e-commerce, he knows that 97% of his problems is delivery. And in, in some other countries like ours and, and many, uh, it's payment. Because most of the people do COD and then you put your neck in the hands of the customers. He said, no, I don't want it now. So you have to pay for the return also. So it's delivery and payments. That's why we think that the post have got all the components to be the most successful e-commerce platform and player. E-commerce is not just the uh, business to consumer, it's business to business, business to government, and business uh, to, to consumer. So all sorts of uh, and consumer to consumer. We, uh, in Saudi Post, we have two kinds of uh, services that we offer. We offer a marketplace, just like eBay, where we don't do the uh, store management. We don't handle the merchandise. We deal only with catalogs and uh, items and prices that we get. And of course, we do the customer service because we do the delivery and we do the payments. And it's basically making money out of resources that, you, that we already have in the post. The second type of e-commerce, which is really the, the store management. Sometimes you have to buy some uh, maybe good products that you want to ship and you want to do the logistics for it and send to the customer and make more money of it. And of course, the guy who called the pizza house and wants it, and wants it as an attachment, I think we can help him with our model. Of course, not only within Saudi Arabia. We also, we know that most of our customers, or many of our customers also, also buy stuff from the United States, from Europe. So we made arrangements with companies to give a local address in the United Kingdom and in the United States. And we facilitate local payments. I mean, so they, they ship, if you buy, if you are in Saudi Arabia, you go to Saudi Post. And, and, and you buy, or if you go to Amazon, for example, you put your US address in there, which will go to one of the companies that we contracted, now it's UPS, it was iParcel and it is bought by UPS, and they will ship it to us. So it will be cheaper and this will facilitate, this is what we call Wasil al alami in Saudi Arabia. Uh, also we have, it's all about agreements. We have a full agreement with Amazon that any shipment that is going to Saudi Arabia, regardless of the way the, the customer chooses, it will be sent to Saudi Post, and we deliver it there. Of course, Amazon is a big company, and uh, they, they re their reputation is very important, so they had to test Saudi Post and make sure that they can deliver, and they, and they satisfy the requirement so we can deliver for them in Saudi Arabia. And of course, e-government. What, what is e-government? There are, again, government to consumer, government to government, and government to businesses. These, either we have it, as I said, we can deliver documents, because we have the delivery networks. We, have, uh, we can deliver documents, we can receive customers in our offices, because we already have the office network. So many of the things uh, that we do in e-government, basically utilization of the networks that we have. But we do something more in Saudi Arabia. We have the addressing system, which we had to establish as Saudi Post in the country, and to zip the whole country, so we have data in these zip codes. We have demographic data, which helps the government to be an e-government, to plan well for opening schools, for opening hospitals, for deciding on so many decisions within the country. Of course, financial services. Again, we have the uh, IFS, we have a local bank, uh, we have offices, we could transfer money cheaper for the people who would like to transfer money. So I think there is no change in the DNA of POS. It, it, it is just moving in one of the dimension, either up or down, and utilizing the resources that you have. Finally, we have a transportation network. We converted this transformation network into a logistic network, which really now our, 
and, and, and it is changed, and in, in fact, it's a company now. It's going to be a listed company. It's called Naqil. Uh, this company, only 15% of its work is uh, postal work. The rest of it, it is a basic, almost a basic infrastructure for the economy. We handle all the fashion stores in Saudi Arabia. So they don't have to stock sizes, different sizes in different areas in the, in the country. They just, I mean, the lady comes in, her size is 42 and only 44 is available. She goes to the cashier, he will put it in, in the system, it will go to Naqil, Naqil will bring it from any uh, other part of uh, uh, this store. Also, we are infrastructure for the food industry. You know, Saudi Arabia is almost a continent. And we have a problem with the expiration date of, of canned foods. So since we really uh, go over 6,000 points within the country, then we pass almost by every store that carries some of these canned food. So we handle most of the major brands, whether it is Nastale, Alali, Goody, whatever. We keep a record of the expiration date of all the canned food within the country, and we take it and we deliver the new ones to this. Now, the final, uh, and of course, direct marketing is the thing that we do. We receive mailing details, we have the database, we can clean, we can help, we can alter, we can print, and we can post and deliver. We handle a number of airlines, loyalty cars like Al Fursan and Sky Team and, and, and others. We handle the delivery, the printing, the management of the database and delivery of these items. Of course, the other thing, the most important thing is telecom. Now we own, uh, we are a major uh, holder with Libara. Of course, I'm sure everybody knows Libara in Saudi Arabia. Libara, Saudi Arabia, is majorly owned by Saudi Post. For what? It's for resource that we have. It's the offices that we have in Saudi Arabia. And the company is, is, is doing very well right now. Uh, of course, uh, we had to alter so many things to be able to serve the customers and the trends that we have seen. We are using 24 by 7 convenient delivery uh, mail stations. And of course, a very important part of our uh, computer network is the RFID tracking system. Everything is trackable within Saudi Arabia that goes to the post. We have RFID tags that goes into EMS and into, in, and into our boxes and everything, anything that goes in and out in any of our installations will be tracked and trackable. And of course, a very important thing is the KPI monitoring. We have people who sit down and watch these gauges to know are we doing well or are we, are, uh, or we are not. And to figure out problems when they happen because we believe that we know that when a package is going to be delayed before the customer knows. He will know when it comes five days or six days and he did not get it. We know this two days earlier that it's going to be late. So we have to respond to that and tell him that your package is going to be delayed. Finally, we, we mean business. Most of these units that I talked about already, companies that we own as Saudi Post, or we are part, or we partly own with some businesses in Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much, and I think we'll hear more about this later. Thank you very much, Dr. Benton, for this interesting view on what is happening at Saudi Post. Notre prochain orateur est Philippe Metzger, directeur général de l'OFCOM, les régulateurs suisses. Philippe a travaillé comme conseiller juridique principal pour une société américaine dans l'informatique américaine et il a travaillé pour le EFTA en tant que directeur du commerce division des relations avant de rejoindre en 2007 l'OFCOM. Philippe va nous expliquer ses points de vue sur l'innovation dans le domaine numérique et l'innovation postale en général. Philippe, la parole est à vous. Merci. Monsieur le Président de la Conférence, Excellence, Honorable Délégué, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi d'être devant vous aujourd'hui pour pouvoir discuter du thème de l'innovation 
C'est la première fois que j'ai le plaisir euh, de faire euh, un discours à l'UPU, notamment à la conférence de stratégie, et je me permets ainsi peut-être une, une introduction un peu non conventionnelle. Je pense qu'en tant que débutant, on a encore le droit de faire ça. En arrivant euh, à ce centre de conférence ce matin, je me suis rendu compte qu'à Genève se tient actuellement, euh, cette semaine, le 43e Salon international des inventions de Genève. Et il me semble que euh, l'UPU doit être félicité pour l'excellent timing d'avoir choisi euh, de tenir sa conférence stratégique sur le thème de l'innovation, notamment en même temps. Donc je pense si d'ici à demain soir, euh, nous n'aurons pas encore suffisamment d'inspiration, d'idées pour l'innovation, nous pourrons peut-être nous rendre ensemble euh, à ce salon d'invention. Euh, mais euh, voyons déjà jusqu'à où euh, nous amènent les différentes discussions que nous menons aujourd'hui et demain. Je vous propose de brièvement couvrir deux volets euh, sur ce thème de l'innovation qui nous occupe. Premièrement, euh, l'innovation dans le domaine du numérique sous l'aspect, je dirais, de citoyens ou de citoyennes numériques. Et le deuxième volet, euh, plus précisément, le positionnement de l'instance gouvernementale en Suisse sur l'innovation postale. Commençons donc par l'innovation et la citoyenneté, citoyenneté numérique. Elle nous intéresse particulièrement à l'Office fédéral de la communication, puisque nous sommes chargés par le Conseil fédéral suisse de tenir compte des évolutions dans le domaine des nouvelles technologies et de l'information et de la communication, et de façonner l'avenir du numérique en Suisse. Ceci, bien sûr, en étroite collaboration avec nos partenaires, parce que nous sommes décidément aujourd'hui dans une ère de multipartie prenante, multi-stakeholderism, pour utiliser le beau terme euh, anglais, et c'est évident que seulement en réunissant les forces de part et d'autre, des instances gouvernementales, du secteur privé, de la société, que nous arriverons euh, à nous servir au mieux d'éthique. Les objectifs stratégiques euh, de notre gouvernement pour la société de l'information visent, grâce à cette éthique, euh, notamment à rendre l'espace économique suisse innovant et compétitif et euh, à faire en sorte que l'éthique puisse profiter à toutes et à chacun. Ce que nous observons, c'est que l'éthique ont ainsi ouvert des champs d'action où le secteur postal pourrait puiser des éléments intéressants pour son développement. Les gens sont de plus en plus mobiles, ils utilisent leur smartphone pour une pléthore de services, vous connaissez ça, les courriers, les courriers électroniques, le porte-monnaie numérique, faire des courses, envoyer des cartes postales ou encore payer les factures. Donc nous sommes aujourd'hui dans un monde qui, s'il si, euh, arrive à mobiliser ses éthiques, il va ouvrir une pléthore de possibilités aux acteurs traditionnellement euh, agissant dans le secteur postal. Et nous constatons avec plaisir que plusieurs de ces services, effectivement, sont déjà offerts par des fournisseurs, que ce soit des fournisseurs postaux ou d'autres fournisseurs. Ce développement technologique ouvre également euh, la voie à des nouvelles formes de participation au processus démocratique. C'est là le deuxième élément de ce premier brelet sur lequel j'aimerais insister. Nous avons par exemple euh, une, un agenda de vote électronique. Nous avons un agenda d'accès simplifié aux, et ciblé des particuliers aux données et aux informations des autorités, de rendre toute cette manne de données dont disposent les autorités accessibles à, à tous. Et puis, euh, en justement rendant ces processus administratifs plus transparents et en accroissant aussi l'efficacité et la rentabilité des processus gouvernementaux, nous arriverons aussi à réduire les obstacles qui séparent euh, les gouvernements et les citoyennes et les citoyens. Donc il y a d'énormes possibilités qui se dégagent à partir de là. Et bien entendu, n'oublions pas que ça pose également toute une série de nouveaux défis. Nous avons bien sûr des défis en matière de sécurité, euh, de la communication, de la protection de la vie privée. Et il est évidemment primordial que nous ayons les bonnes bases juridiques pour euh, pouvoir faire face à ces défis-là. Il va également, euh, évidemment, euh, de pair avec cela qu'il faut former les citoyennes et les citoyens, notamment les jeunes, euh, qui découvrent et souvent sont très, à, très à, au point techniquement, qui, qui découvrent peut-être plus, plus, plus difficilement les défis euh, par lesquels ils seraient confrontés à l'avenir. Et d'ailleurs, euh, je citerai juste un exemple, en Suisse, nous avons un programme national jeunes et médias qui consiste à promouvoir et à euh, 
améliorer la formation des jeunes dans l'ère numérique. Donc l'accès à cette citoyenneté digitale que j'ai mentionnée est vraiment pour nous un aspect qui peut devenir un pilier aussi de la démocratie directe, qui fait force, la force de la Suisse. Et donc en rassemblant le e-gouvernement d'une part et le e-routing d'autre part, comme exemple, nous pensons que nous pourrons aussi dégager des pistes intéressantes pour différentes entreprises à offrir des services dans ce domaine-là, notamment les entreprises Postal. Je mentionnais juste encore à titre d'exemple que la Poste suisse et d'autres fournisseurs en fait en Suisse euh, qui sont actifs dans le domaine non postal euh, ont développé et mis en place toute une série de services par exemple liés à la cybersanté, un autre volet qui se prête à l'innovation, euh, l'identité électronique bien sûr aussi et les courriels sécurisés. Donc il y a vraiment un champ vaste pour pouvoir euh, dégager de l'innovation. Le deuxième volet de ma brève intervention est plus focalisé sur le positionnement sur le thème de l'innovation vraiment en matière postale. Tout d'abord, j'aimerais relever que l'innovation n'est pas, pas seulement une, une nouveauté technologique, ça peut être un nouveau service, un nouveau produit, mais ça n'a pas obligatoirement besoin d'être une technologie d'information et de communication. Je nuance ainsi un tout petit peu ce que je dis dans ma première partie de l'intervention, mais je pense qu'il est important de garder cela en tête. Qui dit innovation ne dit pas automatiquement TIC. Euh, ça va plus loin de ça. Et si je le dis, c'est que les aspects commerciaux dans l'innovation sont très souvent mis en avant. C'est les premiers aspects qui sont examinés. Et parfois, on oublie un tout petit peu qu'il y a un facteur humain qui est extrêmement important dans l'innovation. Le facteur humain reste en effet essentiel. Et d'ailleurs, si je peux mentionner quand même ce, ce fait intéressant, aucun autre secteur, à ma connaissance, ne jouit d'un réseau humain aussi large et dense que celui de la Poste. Il y a plus de 600 000 bureaux, selon mes informations, de Poste qui sont recensés dans le monde entier. On, et là, on voit bien qu'on se retrouve dans un secteur qui s'oriente vers l'éthique, qui fait de l'innovation, mais qui garde, bien sûr, un, un facteur humain très important. Donc, tester euh, l'innovation sous l'aspect technique et économique est très important, mais il faut également la sortir d'une étude au préalable des effets au niveau de la société. Ça ne veut pas dire pour autant qu'il faut tout de suite tout réglementer. J'ai bien entendu l'appel ce matin du ministre tunisien que les régulateurs ne devraient pas devenir des castrateurs. Il ne s'agit pas de ça. Nous voulons une innovation qui soit aussi libre que possible parce que seulement en laissant un champ très vaste à ses forces, pouvons-nous atterrir avec des solutions concrètes qui, qui voient le jour. Mais il y a euh, un équilibre, évidemment, dans ce processus-là. L'innovation n'est pas un but en soi, mais elle doit constamment être mise en balance avec les besoins réels de notre société. Quant à l'UPU, pour euh, terminer euh, mon intervention, même si l'innovation n'est pas directement de son ressort, il va sans dire que nous pouvons, Pensons que l'UPU peut encore être stimulé dans cette l'innovation peut encore être stimulée dans cette organisation qui est l'UPU. Nous avons constaté avec satisfaction aussi les déclarations encourageantes du directeur général, justement de vouloir aller de l'avant avec l'innovation de l'organisation même et des processus et des produits. Déjà aujourd'hui, l'UPU bien sûr offre des produits tout à fait innovants qui facilitent les processus entre les opérateurs. Et en poussant ces démarches encore plus loin, par des systèmes originaux et des échanges d'informations, nous pensons que l'UPU peut encore contribuer davantage à éviter des désagréments dont certains ont déjà fait état aujourd'hui, manque d'interopérabilité, coûts rédhibitoires pour les petits envois, délais non respectés, manque de transparence et de fiabilité. Donc tous ces facteurs-là freinent évidemment le développement du commerce en ligne. Donc c'est un magnifique territoire, si je peux ainsi dire. C'est un magnifique territoire, toutes ces complications pour des innovations. J'aimerais à cette occasion saluer les, euh, la récente conclusion des travaux au sein de l'OMC. Nous avons vu qu'il y a toute une série d'acteurs qui doivent être mis en réseau. Donc évidemment, cet euh, accord sur la facilitation des échanges va, espérons-le, contribuer à la facilitation, à facilitation aussi du commerce électronique. Et nous ne pouvons donc que encourager l'UPU à développer encore mieux les standards qui règlent le secteur postal, que l'UPU devienne une véritable plateforme 
à nouveau multipartite, un esprit d'ouverture où il y a une émulation entre les acteurs, pas seulement, seulement les acteurs traditionnels, et que, évidemment, qu'il faudra aussi la coopération internationale, aussi au niveau des organismes tels qu'on l'a beaucoup à Genève ici, par exemple, euh, l'UIT. Et donc, comme pays hôte, de nombreuses de ces organisations nous sont bien entendu à disposition pour aussi jouer un rôle de facilitateur à ce sujet-là. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci Philippe. Un régulateur qui déclare qu'il n'est pas un obstacle. Très bien, on aime ça. Our next speaker of this session is Professor Ramley, Director General of the Ministry of Communication and IT in Indonesia. Professor Ramley holds a Doctor Engineer from the German University of Duisburg Essen and a Master's in Telecommunication Engineering from the University of uh, Wollongong in Australia, if I pronounce this well. Professor Ramley will tell us more on his views on the implementation of the Doha Post Strategy, diversification of posts, financial inclusion, innovation, and how the Indonesian postal sector enabled and implemented innovation. Professor Ramley, the floor is yours. Thank you, moderator, Peter. Honorable delegates, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we are aware of that, the rapid development of ICTs has significantly impacts the growth of postal business, particularly letter post services. The certain circumstances has driven postal operators to innovate and develop parcel posts, logistics, and financial transaction services. Business competition in the postal service requires governments to concern seriously. Henceforth, a healthy competition climate can be achieved. Moreover, state-owned postal operator is also required to conduct various breakthroughs so that it is able to develop its postal businesses. Indonesia makes the Doha postal strategy as a guidance in the national management and development of postal services. The government performs important roles in facilitating cooperation among postal operators and related government institutions or agencies, such as Ministry of Transportation, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Finance, Director General of Customs. Determining standards for universal postal services and commercial postal services through ministerial regulations, and defining universal postal services tariffs and tariffs formula for commercial postal devices. Indonesia government encourages the utilization of ICTs by developing Indonesia national single windows in the effort to accelerate goods inspection process by customs, which has been integrated within the ASEAN single window. The government also entrusts state-owned postal operator as an agent of development, for instance, as a distributor of government direct assistance to society and general election strategies. In the field of financial services, Post Indonesia utilizes ICTs to develop its business on financial services independently or through joint partnerships by scrutinizing the profiles and needs of its customers. Several services which have been developed comprise of instant money order, online gyro, online payment. Recently, it is launched financial service called Mpost Pay, a digital service which enables subscribers to easily perform transactions just from their gadgets. We are also conducting a survey in four provinces in Indonesia to identify money-saving patterns in households. The results of the survey, it is known that 41 0.8% of those societies save their cash within their homes. Given the marginal propensity to the safe assumptions, MPS, that is the additional proportion of society's income to be saved, is 25%, thus the amount of society's collected funds within one year will accumulate to, to around 500 billion rupees. Taking into account the results of the mention survey and as a precursor to implement financial inclusion, the government designates Post Indonesia to conduct a pilot project called the Post Saving Accounts. Why? Because its expansive network reaching remote corners of Indonesia 
with around 4,000 post offices, 3,700 online post offices, 236 mobile services, and 24,000 point of sales, then uh, Post Indonesia is a logical choice of this project. Second, it applies relatively lower administration charges. Third, it is highly trusted by the society. Even in some corners of Indonesia, people trust a postal services more than banks. Although the bank also very limited in the major cities and uh, regions. Regarding the implementation, uh, sorry, during the beginning of 2014, Post Indonesia has also launched an e-commerce clearinghouse service to ease and bridge SMEs' needs in selling their products to domestic and international markets through online selling. An advantage in operating the e-commerce service is that it integrates an e-commerce portal with distribution networks and payment. To expand its distribution and service networks, Post Indonesia has also developed the post agent model, which does not require any additional asset investment and minimizes expenses which may currently emerge in the, or in the future, as well as it contributes towards the empowerment of the people economies. With the purpose of optimizing ideal company assets in various locations, from a cost center to become a profit center, Post Indonesia also expands into the property business based on the highest, based on the highest and best use. Study conducted, idle assets are identified, developed, and professionally managed by subsidiary companies in the property sector to become business centers such as hotels, offices, malls, and etc. It is also good if I mention here Indonesian government will also establish national e-commerce development plan that will be finished by the end of this year. It will facilitate the integration of postal sector into e-commerce ecosystems, e-commerce value chain. For your information, e-commerce transaction in Indonesia is 15 billion US dollar. In the year 2013, it, be it became 18 billion dollar, 18 billion US dollar in 2014, and is predicted to reach 24 billion dollar by, by the end of 2015. Based on this presentation, it can be concluded that the key factors to Indonesia's uh, tracks in developing postal sector are as follows: first, provision of regulations which accommodates postal business developments. Second, sensitivity of stakeholders in anticipating developments in the business environment. The third, provision of services which fulfills society needs. Fourth, utilization of IT as an enabler for service innovation. The fifth, escalation of operation with relevant business entities. And the last but not least is the society's participation in determining ex the expansion of postal services points. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Please join us again for the panel discussion. And I want to start with um, a question for Dr. Benton. Um, innovation in a postal company can only be successful, in my point of view, when there is top management attention, when the CEO is convinced, when the CEO is uh, is steering, heading the innovation programs, is uh, freeing up budgets, is giving people the opportunity to succeed or to fail also in innovation. How is it organized in Saudi Post? How did you structure the innovation tracks of your teams and your company? Can you share that with us? Uh, yes, I think uh, a strategic plan is very important. And I think one of the things that we did in Saudi Post is first to have a strategic plan and uh, set up deadlines and clearly uh, have initiatives and where are they leading to. And of course, um, I think you never get uh, strategic plans implemented at the right time because we have a board at the top of us uh, which always uh, 
or many times uh, I mean, sack down some of the initiatives, but we have to try again and again. Uh, but I think this is the key, is really to have a strategic plan <clears throat> and to have the initiatives available and the benefits of implementing and going on the road clear to everybody, uh, even if, for example, the CEO is not there. There are people who know their role and what they are supposed to do in order to go forward. Okay. Going back on that, or going further on that, is there a specific innovation team that works on new plans, or is it embedded in the organization of the business? I think uh, we have a good team, uh, so uh, when we sit down, we have, uh, of course, regular meetings, sometimes weekly, to discuss these initiatives and the direction and, and what is happening in the postal world and in, in the consumer world, and I think from this we get the ideas. Okay, very good, thank you. Botond, um, Post Europe has a lot of members, European postal members, Coming back on the same question, is innovation high enough on the agenda of the CEOs and the executive committees? Do they spend enough time on it? Do they free up enough budgets on it? What's your view on that? Yes. Uh, so we are an industry association. Obviously, our membership is uh, very different. Uh, we have uh, big members, small members from west, east, north, south uh, with uh, more developed markets, less developed markets. So it is obviously difficult to, uh, to give you a general uh, picture. However, I see that uh, the situation has definitely changed in the recent years. So innovation has become uh, more and more important on the agenda of the top management. And fortunately enough, not only related to the possible growth areas, E-commerce is an obvious example. We see how much uh, important is to us through uh, the industry initiative. So it is unavoidable uh, to the CEOs to, uh, to not to uh, discuss, of course, about e-commerce. But there is uh, innovation also related to the core business. We underline at all the cases, at all the occasions that uh, of course, we have to look at the growth uh, opportunities, but uh, before introducing drones, uh, before introducing 3D printing, which might come in the future, we mustn't forget that we have a very important core uh, business. And it was interesting also to see, uh, by chance you were chairing the same uh, uh, session uh, with the three uh, CEOs uh, in Vienna, uh, it was uh, Belgian Post, uh, Portugal, and uh, Austrian Post. And they were all describing a similar strategy. Defending the core, being innovative on the letter mail, because here in Europe, and I think me as post-Europe, I can talk about the European specificities. Here uh, in Europe, we have still, even with the decreasing volume, relatively You still high. have to invest in mail, that's what you're saying. Okay. Absolutely, and it's good news that it is on the agenda of the top management. Okay, thank you very much. Innovation, we have seen a couple of examples in the postal world, and I heard Mr. Benton mention that he is delivering pizzas in Saudi Arabia to the mailman. Yeah. So in going into food delivery, Food delivery is the next big thing in e-commerce. Yeah? Uh, a lot of posts are doing some trials on that. Austria Post is doing it, Belgian Post is doing it, German Post, Deutsche Post is doing it, maybe many others that I don't know yet. Um, first, Dr. Benton, are you in food delivery today? You mentioned something on that, but is the, is the mailman delivering groceries at home? No, or will uh, they do that? Uh, it's not the... Uh food delivery, home delivery, I mentioned about the canned food industry. So it's a logistic operation. That's, that's something different. That Will you deliver tomorrow fresh pizzas at home? You know, I, I mentioned two things. Since if we invested in a network and we have a capability that we could utilize, we'll do anything. I mean, we do other things maybe other posts don't do uh, because we have the capability and we have the people and we have the network. So I think maybe if 
people cannot deliver pizza, we will deliver it, and if people cannot even bake it, we'll bake it and deliver it. So <laughs> <laughs> That's not so complex in Saudi Arabia with your temperatures to bake it on the road. Yeah. So Switzerland is also doing tests and delivery of groceries. In the UK, for example, 20% of the groceries are ordered online already today. Yeah? So I think it's a big thing. What's happening in Switzerland? Philippe, est-ce que tu peux nous partager ce qui se passe avec euh, la Poste Suisse well, au niveau de la... I, I don't think I can um, give you the same degree of, of information as, as the CEO of, of Saudi Post, since I'm not um, representing Saudi Post. As a Post. regulator, I'm, you I'm, should know I'm what's another, happening. By the way, just to set the record straight, um, Ofcom has a number of regulatory functions in the postal uh, affairs. Actually, is a rather good governance system where we have really a, a function as, a, as part of the ministry. And we have a, a uh, postal commission that is the actual regulator, independent commission, uh, that is nominated by the government, just to, to set the record good, straight. Good to hear, but go to the question, please. Is well, Swiss, this question is difficult Swiss for me. To, I, haven't, I haven't personally received any groceries from Swiss Post yet. Uh, what I would like to say, maybe from a governance perspective, um, going into new, into new realms of, of business and detecting new opportunities in a, in a segment that's really new to the population may be easier for a post that um, still has a very uh, high public profile, uh, rather than being overly innovative, let's say, or very innovative on traditional services. So I think, in general, it's easier probably to break new ground than to innovate in a, an established type of service that the citizens and the customers know very well. Okay, let me touch it to something else. We have the biggest network in the world, all the posts together. We are the biggest employers in the world. I think we also have the biggest fleet in the world altogether. Mm -hmm. And probably, and for sure, we are the biggest polluter in the world. <laughs> <laughs> We're talk, all talking about many, many years about innovation in electric vehicles. What's going on? What is happening? Because I don't see it happen. Everywhere in Europe where I go, and even in the US and other countries, it's still the normal vehicles are there. Sometimes you see an electric bike, and sometimes you see one test with a couple of electric vehicles. What is going on in industry? Maybe Dr. Benton, you first and then Philip afterwards. Are you delivering with electric vehicles yet? Uh, let me uh, just explain how we are doing the business. I think uh, what we try to do is whenever we have a very well-defined sector, for example, if you look at the logistics sector, Naqal company, which was originally a transportation network of Saudi Post, it became a company, now it's doing the logistic, now it's going to be listed, an IPO. Uh, we don't regulate, and even the postal regulator does not regulate that company. It's the transportation commission which regulates that company. If you look at our financial operation, we have a company called Irsal that we established with a local bank, and now it's going into uh, full financial businesses. We don't regulate this. So it's totally regulated by SAMA, the Saudi Monetary Agency. Uh, the uh, Libara company, which is the telecom company. We don't regulate it. The My ITC question is on not yes, a regulation. I understand. So my question is that's on why electric we try, vehicles. I tried, at least with my people in Saudi Post, is uh, to run away from a postal regulation because we run networks and we want to utilize them to do our job. But you job. don't need a regulator to, to buy electric vehicles, do you? So, so, I mean, what I'm uh, leading to is that the, uh, the most of the people who have the cars is this knuckle company. Okay. So they are regulated there, and I think they are trying to do th something, but we, are, we don't have to do with that anything. <laughs> <laughs> Philippe. No, since, since, you asked, since you asked me a question earlier that I couldn't really answer precisely, I certainly see more electric uh, tricycles than, than vegetables uh, from the Swiss Post. So it is quite clear that is, that is on. So the, the, on. the mailman uh, comes with an electric tricycle in Switzerland. I haven't seen any, any, any uh, uh, old-fashioned engines anymore. Professor, Indonesia, electric vehicles? Yeah, they use uh, electric motorbike, Ele electric uh, bicycle. Yeah. Okay. In, government in subsidies or not? Is it through uh, their own initiative? Government... Uh, give subsidy to, to electric vehicle, but unfortunately, until now, f not for the electric bike, the electric uh, car. Electric cars, yeah. okay. Botons, your view, briefly, short? Yes. Europe, we have very good examples, and beyond the electric vehicles, I think it is important to underline that we have programs 
uh, both uh, in the context of post-Europe, IPC and UPU in terms of reducing the greenhouse gas mm -hmm. emission. And we have reached, as an industry, very impressive uh, results, minus 10 to 20 percent. And I think this is the bottom line that counts, and of course, electric vehicles can contribute Good. to okay. that. Okay. Before we go to the floor for more questions, I have one other topic which was mentioned by everybody I think here in the panel it's about the digital innovation yeah. over the last let's say 15 years in all the conferences that was the biggest topic of post yeah before the e-commerce was there now it's only e-commerce everybody was going to invest and make plans and big promotions on the digital innovation and digital platforms for hybrid mail and digital mail and so, on, and so on. As far as I know, nobody, as opposed, ever made money with that. Yeah? Can I come back to that here in the panel? Is, is, are you making money with digital products as you post? Of course. Uh, I think uh, the digital investment is really the thing that uh, helped us now make money. For example, these uh, dashboards that we have, it let us monitor everything in Saudi Post, and this is without the, digital, the, the investment that we did on the network and on the GMS networks and, and uh, links to readers, and it wouldn't uh, work. Um, these uh, mail stations controlling it, and even yeah, but that's something different. I, I clearly no. Want we to make know money out of this digital mail. Digital mail. You can make money. The with marketing, that. Uh, the direct marketing center. I think it's making good money. Uh, it's getting, it's printing invoices for uh, okay. uh, some of the bank that do still print paper invoices, and it is delivering the, uh, as I said, the airline uh, loyalty cards and packages. Uh, to the people. But there's a physical component still. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's important. And, yeah. and, and I think uh, that was a good investment. Okay. And it will have uh, also some more uh, uses for that in the future. Okay. Professor, digital mail as a product in Indonesia, is it making money? Uh, I think Dr. Benton, as the CEO of the Postal, company knows better than me, then I think they make money. But they make more money in digital services, not digital mail. Okay. Like a transaction, money transaction, financial transaction. Good. Okay, we'll now open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, I think we have a first request from Tunisia. You Tunisia have the floor? Is that still on Tunisia? There's nobody from Tunisia. Then we go to Moldova. Moldova has a question. Where is Moldova? Or Moldova? Nobody here? Okay. Then France here in the front. Yes. Oui, merci, Monsieur le médiateur, de me donner la parole. Non, juste par rapport à la question que vous avez posée sur les véhicules électriques, bah, il y a l'exemple de la Poste française, puisque aujourd'hui nous avons 21 000 véhicules électriques. Combien 21 000. 21 000. C'est-à-dire que 25 de ce qui roule à la Poste à quatre roues, à trois roues ou à deux roues est aujourd'hui électrifié. Voilà. Parfait. Donc c'est -ce subsidié par le gouvernement ou est-ce que c'est votre propre initiative C'est notre propre initiative, mais il y a effectivement des aides du gouvernement pour euh, notamment les véhicules utilitaires. Voilà. Euh, je voudrais dire aussi que les véhicules électriques, ce n'est pas uniquement bon pour lutter contre la pollution, mais c'est aussi bon pour améliorer les conditions de travail des conducteurs. On a par exemple une baisse de l'accidentologie supérieure à 50% chez les conducteurs de véhicules électriques comparés aux conducteurs de véhicules à essence ou diesel parce qu'il n'y euh, a pas de vitesse à passer, il euh, n'y a pas de bruit et donc les conducteurs sont beaucoup plus attentifs à l'environnement extérieur. Et concrètement, ça se traduit par une baisse de l'absentéisme de 6 jours par an en moyenne par conducteur de véhicules électriques. Donc tout ça, c'est à réintégrer dans le calcul du coût économique du véhicule électrique. Très bien, merci bien. Are there other questions? Even? I think it's 
I can't read it from here, but I think it's um, Nigeria. Nigeria. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I hear in this conference and uh, in all postural discussions, the, the common word is uh, innovation and innovation. And then in my own opinion, innovation um, uh, stands on, uh, on, on knowledge and also investments. And uh, as we all know, gathered in this room, we are postal administrators of different um, uh, uh, um, um, growth levels or different levels. And uh, um, in this issue of innovation, uh, I think the post has been left behind because we did not take knowledge very seriously. And most of us still are not taking knowledge um, um, seriously. Uh, I can give you the example. What makes all of us shiver today is internet. And the internet, in my own opinion, is actually um, the post office uh, 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 virtualized. Uh, you look at all the, the processes of internet, it is the post office processes from the beginning to the end. It's, and and the, the, anybody that created internet really studied the postal uh, um, uh, processes. And it is because uh, the post didn't take knowledge uh, seriously. So what is changing the world now is taken from the, from the world and, 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 and produce and make us to be running after that. Now, um, how seriously... Can, can you come to your question, please? Yes, the if question, you have a question is, how the panel? seriously are we taking research and knowledge in the, in the field of, of, um, of the posts. Okay, is that a question for some particular panelist? Yeah. Or is and it... also, about the investments, is, is, is it only selling, because the post is not only the, the physical mail uh, aspect or delivery aspect, it's also a three-dimensional thing, the physical, the, the, the digital, and also the financial services. So I hear also, uh, like you also Ask, ask somebody uh, from maybe e eBay whether they are going to buy a postal uh, um, company. So, does it, are we discussing here that uh, um, the post uh, or, or is only for, 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 for delivery of e-commerce and it's only maybe e-commerce uh, companies that can buy over postal administrations? Thank you. Okay. I think we had already answers on how important innovation is and how it should be on the attention of the executive committees. Your question is specifically, um, is a post only the last mile delivery for e-commerce or is it more? Is it also the, the digital comment and so on? Uh, Philippe, do you want to that? Yes, um, I, th I think it's a very pertinent observation from, from the delegate from Nigeria. Um, I could maybe make a little comparison to a different sector, which is the media sector. We have a very similar discussion at the moment in Switzerland within the media sector because the traditional models of producing print in particular um, poses a huge challenge going forward for those, for those uh, newspapers and, and, and editors. And I think it's true that you know, as long as the case was valid and as long as things worked, fine, innovation wasn't too high on the agenda. And so I think now everybody is challenged in a sense. And I think that goes for the media sector and also for the postal sector, as has been mentioned by the delegate from Nigeria, that innovation is higher on the radar and it becomes, as you said, it becomes something for the CEO and a, str a major strategy aspect. So I think in that sense, we are all challenged here uh, in this and we have to step it up in a sense to, uh, to meet the, the challenges of the future. Okay, so innovation is not only on the last mile, it's broader, yeah. it's also on financial services, yeah. it's also on digital service. Innovation covers the whole uh, postal industry. Professor, you also want to comment yeah, on yeah. that? I want to comment on, 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 uh, on that, on that, on that thing. Yeah. I think we could, we could see the postal sector similar to telecommunication sector. We have to, to think in three layers now. Physical layer in, it, in which how you deliver the physical the physical uh, things, the physical package to, to the last mile uh, person or last mile house. 
And then the network layer, which is the, the digital layer, and how you manage your network digitally. And then the last, the last one is the, the upper one. It is very important is the application la layer, application level. This is how you innovate your services in order to be, to be sustained in, in this world. I think we could see the sector post very similar to the telecommunication sector. Good, thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, I see over there a request, which is Iran, if I'm not wrong. Iran, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to make some comments with regard to digital investment. Uh, we believe that uh, digital investment does not directly generate money. It, also, it uh, always avoids losing money and, of course, it uh, helps us improve the quality of our service. Uh, I've heard when Dr. Button uh, were talking uh, about his uh, presentation, I've heard about USO. Uh, how do you consider USO in e-commerce de development? In, according to our data, we have uh, our own uh, e-commerce platform. 30% uh, of e-commerce uh, items generated through online shopping are delivered in rural areas in Iran. Have you got any idea in this regard? Thank you. Philip, can you answer on, on this question? It's USO, it's regulation. Well, of course, in a, in a converging uh, world, we, as far as the Swiss experience is concerned, we certainly have a very strong universal service when it comes to the, to the networks, the telecommunication networks. And that, I guess, would serve us in the future as some of these services move uh, online. On the other hand, of course, for the physical uh, presence and the physical distribution, that's also something which has a very high uh, political uh, rank. Um, and which is, which is something which needs a political discussion to determine what the scope should be and how it is supposed to be financed. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers the questions. There was another here, uh, Dominican Republic, wants to have the floor, you can have it. Please push the button, please push the button first of the microphone. Push again, please. Yes. Sí, es al, al doctor Benten. Eh, el protocolo que ustedes han establecido de control de calidad en tiempos de entrega que han implementado y que usted puso, ha, ha sido complejo eh, implementarlo. Fue muy complejo. O, ¿O no hubo mucha dificultad con, eh, a nivel de los eh, eh, empleados que estaban en, eh, trabajando, que trabajan en, en ese, con, con la distribución de esos productos? Los niveles de tiempo, controles de tiempo, eh, eh, así, etc. Sorry, there was a little bit uh, lost in translation in the beginning. This question is for who specifically? For who is this question? Al doctor Benten, al al de al al director de de correos de Arabia Saudita. Okay, you got the question. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, one of the very difficult issues to deal with is the uh, workforce in the postal industry, especially if you are changing the way things are going to work. Uh, so we have a special sector uh, in Saudi Post called change management. And they are in charge of looking at the issue, how are we going, for example, if, if the delivery man is not used to have a deadline in delivery or number of items to deliver and we want to impose such restriction, then those guys in the change management sector would go and make a program for, for, for those guys who are going uh, through a change in their style of work or uh, the way they are going to do the work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, of course. Uh, I think maybe in Dominican it's the same since it is part of the government. I mean, uh, it's a government organization you always have difficulty in firing people, in changing 
maybe positions, uh, uh, but we have, we have to deal with it. We have a strategic plan, we have to implement, we have uh, time limits for delivery, we have money to make, uh, otherwise we cannot do our future projects. So I think people, uh, you have to be tough sometimes in these issues. Oh, say thank you, Dr. Benton. I, um, before we close the session, I have two questions for all the posts in the room. And please raise your hand if I ask the question so that we have a view on what is happening in your company. We talked about electric vehicles. Yeah. Which post is today already using electric vehicles? If you use electric vehicles, please raise your hand. So which post is using already today electric vehicles? Okay, gives an impression. And the second question before we finish, we talked about delivery of groceries, delivery of food as probably one of the biggest next steps in e-commerce. Today we deliver packages, we deliver goods, we deliver parcels with fashion, shoes and so on. Who believes of all the posts in the room that in five years from now, you also will offer a service of food delivery and grocery delivery at home. Who believes that? Please raise your hand. I think we still need to go to a restaurant for a pizza. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, I would like to thank our excellent speakers and please give them a big hand, thank you. So this is the end of the second panel, which was on innovation. And we now move on to the third panel discussion, which is a very important one on every agenda, which is e-commerce. So may I now ask the speakers of the third panel to come on stage. And that's the following persons. Uh, Mr. Wagner from Brazil, Mr. Ma, Mr. Deepak Chopra, Philippe Wall, Anne Mirou, and Jeremy Doutet. Please come forward. Sorry? Can I just have quick words? Yeah, perfect. I think we are good on time. Yeah. Very perfect. well on time, yeah. yeah. A couple of minor changes. Hello? Um, it's not going to be Jeremy Doutet, it's uh, Nicolas Martin. Ah, that bon. was going to be my first point. Yes. Oh, wow, that's. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, my mind. just handwritten your bio. Yeah, that. that's amazing. Can I do? I'm um, sure. Yes, 12. Countries. Yes. <coughs> so, yes, and, uh, that's great. That's great. Uh, what is your yes. name? Nicolas. Nicolas. Martin. And your exactly the, the other co CEO. Ah, you are the other co CEO. <laughs> <laughs> That's the advantage of having uh, two CEOs. Peter, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank, you very much. thank you very much. I give you my card. So, you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, how was uh, the new direction that we look at things? Very good. Oh, good presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah? I, like, I think it was one of the. Yeah, very good. We, we catch up later? Oh, merci, très bien. J'ai vécu à Bruxelles pendant 5 ans. <laughs> Je suis très belge. Merci. Oui? Ah, très bien, merci. Uh, hello, you're Mr. Ma. Mr. Ma. From China. Okay, Mr. Ma. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Really, thank you. Est-ce que je peux te demander ta carte, mais tu as perdu combien de dizaines de kilos? Pas de dizaines de kilos, quelques, 5. Un certain nombre. 5. Merci parce que j'avais plus de Ah, ça donné. va, monsieur Wall. Well, je vais parler en français. Hein. Pas de problème. Deepak Chopra. We know each other. We have seen each other before. Yeah. Somewhere in a conference of the IPC. All right. Yeah. Okay. I worked at Bipos before. Yeah. I try to stay below the radar, occasionally come out and then go back again. So. But you, now you come out. Very good. <laughs> Bonjour, madame Mirou. Uh, enchanté. Bon, oui. Le micro est encore là, euh, alors je dois être prudent dans ce que j'ai dit. Mais prenez votre place. Euh... 
Jerry give you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I, I didn't go to the, uh, the bio. Sorry. You have the, the bio uh, of this guy. Sorry. That was, yes, that's the bio. Uh, uh, Deepak, Philippe Paul, and Miru. Um, so this is his name again, Nicolas Martin. Kinsey insert two thousand the best retail lounge, world retail rights. Very good. Okay. Um interventions. Okay, wait. We have the Ministry of France Chef wants an inter intervention, then I have IATA. Okay. And then there's another one? Yeah, there's Ministry of France. I have this Swiss. Uh, then there's uh, Chile and Costa Rica. Chile. Okay, perfect. Got it. No, 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 no. The interpreter will be up there. I got it. Got it? Yeah. We're on the case. This is excellent. Yes. Extremely well. Very much. Thanks so too. Very near. Very near for you. <laughs> very good. Right. So you're okay for this? Well, yeah. Sure. It's fine. Yeah, we're good. It's good on time. Tu, tu n'as pas de. You don't have. Uh... Okay, we. We have one more translator here for Mr. Wagner. Um, Cherry. One translator. One translator. You have one. We're missing one translator. Uh, translator headphone. One translator headphone. Do we have another one? Yeah. Yeah. You can take take already mine. I'm very well. Thank you. Yeah. You, when, when you can we, speak over there. Can, can speak? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, we go around I have here. A, I have a little exposure. Very good. Okay. So you have ten minutes maximum. Ten That's minutes. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You, you, you I will, help me. I will give a sign. Oh, sure. Okay. Too yeah. busy. Yeah. Too busy. So <laughs> may I ask you to stick to the ten minutes? Yeah. Ten minutes. Of course. Maximum. Thanks. If if, if longer. <laughs> Please cut I will, I will cut off, yeah. So please, sorry, please, to the 10 minutes. Voilà, on sait déjà. On a prévu 10 minutes pour, pour vous aussi. 10 minutes pour vous, ça va 10 minutes. 10 minutes, vous avez 7, j'ai entendu. Je vous fais 10 si vous voulez 10. Non, non, mais... Je fais ce que vous voulez. C'est très bien. 25 minutes, je vous fais 25. Non. 2 h 10 Le bac de ça va, très Après, bien. Cinq, dix. Parfait, parfait. Comme ça, on a un peu de temps pour euh, la discussion. Ça va. Merci. On va commencer. Uh, yeah, it's fine. So, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Can you please take your seats?
Can you please switch off your mobile phones and put them on silent? And maybe also put your voice on silent so that we can start. Okay, please take your seats. So good afternoon and welcome to this last session of today. I think a very important session, knowing that e-commerce is on the agenda of every executive committee in the postal sector and maybe of every company today in the world being the retailers, financial companies, financial institutions, everybody is looking at e-commerce. And we have a very distinguished uh, panel here that will talk about it. But cross-border e-commerce is recognized as the most important sector of business development for Post and is one of the key strategic areas of focus for the UPU members. In order to respond to the opportunities presented by e-commerce, the UPU consolidated the entire work on e-commerce into one program called EcomPro. And you have seen a movie earlier today which enlightens more what EcomPro can offer. But I will repeat it again because it's important that everybody understands what it means. It covers all the areas of the entire value chain, including webshop management, marketing, payment system, fulfillment, delivery, customer care, and returns and repair. With this in mind, panelists will emphasize the need for the UPU to continue to act swiftly to meet market, consumer, and operational needs. The operational efficiency and market responsiveness of postal operators will be key drivers for the sector's success in gaining and retaining e-commerce market share. Let me hand over to our first speaker, which is Mr. Pinero de Oliveira, the president of Brazilian Post since January 2011. Mr. Pinero de Oliveira was a member of the executive board of Banespa and was the CFO of Banespre, the pension fund of Banespa. He was subsequently the president of the Petros Pension Fund, the pension fund of Petrobras, a well-known a company in the Brazil uh, country. So, um, Mr. Pinero will give his views on e-commerce in Brazil and on the UPU topic. You have the floor. Please come forward. The presentation. presentation, please. Thank you very much, P Mr. Peter Summers. Quero cumprimentar a todos os painelistas. Tem uma breve apresentação para ser feita. There is an issue with the presentation, so there is no presentation in the computer. No apresentation? Yeah. Hey. No problem. Huh? You, do you want us to look up for the presentation and that you come afterwards or you can you do it ah, without? No problem. No, no. Uh, uh, eu falo okay. perfect. Thank you. Without presentation. Bem, muito boa tarde a todos os senhores, todas as senhoras. Para mim é uma satisfação e para os Correios do Brasil uma honra e uma uh, enorme uh, tarefa participar dessa conferência estratégica da UPU. Cumprimento mais uma vez os queridos painelistas, o senhor Peter Summers, senhoras e senhores. Todos nós sabemos que o comércio eletrônico cresce vertiginosamente no mundo e no Brasil não é diferente. Para os senhores terem uma ideia, entre 2011 e 2014, o crescimento foi de 100% de comércio eletrônico no Brasil, de 18 bilhões de reais, valores brasileiros, para 36 bilhões de reais em 2014, em apenas... Quatro anos, nós dobramos de valor o, o comércio eletrônico. E a mesma coisa aconteceu com o número de consumidores no Brasil. 
saindo de 32 milhões de consumidores do comércio eletrônico para 62 milhões entre 2011 e 2014. No que se refere à compra de brasileiros em sites internacionais, também o crescimento foi muito grande. Nos últimos anos, esse crescimento tem sido na, da mesma ordem do citado para as compras do comércio eletrônico no Brasil, sendo que se destacam compras no comércio eletrônico de brasileiros de produtos oriundos da China e produtos oriundos dos Estados Unidos. Isso tudo uh, faz com que temos uma enorme atenção aos, aos clientes, aos consumidores do comércio eletrônico, até porque, uh, no momento em que o setor postal vive, nós, os Correios Brasileiros, não temos dúvida nenhuma da importância que passa a ter o setor de encomendas, o setor de logística e a capacidade que o setor postal tem de se tornar grande fornecedor de produto de logística integrada, em especial para as empresas que dão preferência para o comércio eletrônico. Essas empresas que muitas vezes não possuem lojas, lojas uh, concretas, vamos dizer assim, só tem lojas virtuais, poderem contar com o apoio e a prestação de serviço na, na área de estoque, de controle de estoque, distribuição em todo um país, é muito importante e, por isso, os Correios do Brasil têm dado muita atenção. Nós temos visto, pelas pesquisas atuais, que os consumidores são cada dia mais exigentes, querem acompanhar tudo a partir uh, de informações rápidas, em meio digital, esse meio digital que é também um agente uh, que traz incertezas ao setor postal, mas que também pode ser um agente importante para a nossa modernização e o atendimento rápido aos nossos consumidores. Os consumidores querem ter a possibilidade de escolha da entrega, se querem buscar num autoatendimento, se querem se receber, receber sua encomenda em casa, no trabalho, querem ter a possibilidade de controlar essa entrega e, ao controlar essa entrega, até modificar o, o local de entrega de maneira eletrônica, online, até durante o processo de entrega. Então, todo esse trabalho de compliance, de qualidade de serviço, de controle da entrega, da rastreabilidade e de buscar atender a escolha do cliente em primeiro lugar, tem estado na preocupação dos Correios do Brasil. Hoje, nós entendemos que nós podemos oferecer um processo logístico diferenciado. Esse sempre foi o nosso negócio. O setor postal do mundo todo sempre trabalhou com um processo logístico diferenciado dos seus concorrentes na área de encomendas. E nós temos essa capacidade no entendimento do Correio, dos Correios do Brasil de sermos sempre os líderes desse mercado, se soubermos ah, fazer investimentos, estarmos à frente do nosso tempo e buscar oferecer produtos diferenciados com rapidez e com capacidade de tecnologia de informação muito grande, buscando dar entrega garantida, customizada, uh, dando conveniência e prioridade para os nossos clientes. Nesse sentido, os Correios do Brasil têm trabalhado muito no, no caminho de aprimorar a nossa área de logística e a nossa área de encomendas, que trabalham conjuntamente e cada dia que passa se desenvolve cada vez mais, com investimentos crescentes em rastreabilidade, em acompanhamento uh, dos carteiros, uh, dos nossos entregadores, dos nossos famosos carteiros, para, diretamente para as pessoas e eles trabalhando com smartphones para que eles possam rastrear a encomenda e, e no futuro, muito próximo, para que possam, inclusive, modificar o local de entrega durante um dia de seu trabalho. Nós temos, uh, hoje em dia atendido a 70 mil lojas online no Brasil todo, temos uma participação do mercado superior a 40% no Brasil e temos procurado diversificar essa oferta de serviços, muitos serviços, inclusive, que os caros colegas da UPU já conhecem, como o SEDEX, 
o Sedex Mundi, o Exporta Fácil, o Importa Fácil, o EMS, enfim, uh, nós disponibilizamos diversas modalidades de logística uh, para os nossos clientes, seja para entrega dos seus produtos no Brasil ou fora do Brasil, e da mesma maneira, importando serviços quando os clientes, os cidadãos compram fora do Brasil. Temos disponibilizado diversas modalidades de logística reversa e temos investido muito nessa questão da logística reversa, pós-venda, inclusive, para sermos parceiro, parceiros dos comerciantes, dos vendedores, dos produtores uh, e, e vendedores de serviços do Brasil. Entendemos que a nossa parceria no, no âmbito da, do uso da tecnologia de informação pode chegar até a construção, junto com... Uh, lojistas do comércio eletrônico, de shoppings virtuais, em que a gente possa ser parceiro dessas empresas. Temos a convicção de que a interação tecnológica é algo uh, fundamental e, e essencial para a existência da, dos Correios do mundo todo nos dias de hoje, é buscarmos ter uh, essa integração para que as pessoas, os cidadãos, possam trabalhar no sentido de que a coleta do, da encomenda possa ser feita diretamente na fábrica, entregue na casa ou no, no trabalho ou num terminal de autoatendimento que o cliente do lojista escolha, que a postagem possa ser feita de maneira remota em terminais de autoatendimento, que nós possamos oferecer a logística reversa, a devolução do produto, ou então a logística reversa finalística, que é a devolução final de um produto que vai ser descartado pelo próprio produtor. Nós temos feito entregas interativas, como já falei antes, nossos carteiros ah, estarão nos próximos seis a dez meses, todos eles trabalhando com smartphones para que os produtos rastreáveis, que tenham rastreabilidade, acompanhamento da entrega, uh, possa ser acompanhado pelo comprador e que esse comprador possa fazer uma inter interatividade nessa, uh, nesse momento da entrega e também para que a produtividade do nosso carteiro seja mais elevada, facilitando o seu trabalho no dia a dia. No processo uh, de exportação, os Correios têm tido o objetivo de apoiar empresários brasileiros em busca de serviço seguro, ágil e com baixo custo, que busca permitir o incremento do comércio internacional, em especial para as pequenas empresas brasileiras, inserindo essas pequenas e microempresas brasileiras no mercado internacional, através do exporta fácil, através da abertura de armazéns em grandes centros comerciais, onde a parceria de comércio eletrônico com o Brasil é muito grande, onde, mais uma vez, se destacam os Estados Unidos e a China. E também muitas parcerias com sites, com espaços de negociação na internet do comércio eletrônico. Com a mudança no, na regulamentação, na lei brasileira de atuação dos Correios, nós temos, nos últimos três anos, trabalhado intensamente para diversificar nossos produtos, para atualizar e automatizar nossa triagem de encomendas, para automatizar toda a nossa atenção aos consumidores, mas também aos vendedores, aos lojistas, ao nosso uh, cliente corporativo, para ampliarmos nossa atuação no Brasil e até mesmo fora do Brasil. Nesse sentido, ampliamos nossa parceria no setor financeiro com o Banco do Brasil, onde, ao longo dos próximos 24, 30 meses, nos transformaremos numa instituição financeira que oferece todos os serviços do setor bancário e financeiro que o país, lá no Brasil, se oferece, desde o crédito bancário, conta corrente e até uh, consórcios, seguros, capitalização... Enfim, uma empresa que hoje mesmo já, como correspondentes bancários, atuando num nicho, num pequeno pedaço do setor bancário, o, os Correios do Brasil são a única agência de banco em mais de 1.300 municípios do Brasil. O Brasil tem 
mais de 5.500 municípios. No entanto, em mais de 1.300 municípios do Brasil, a única agência de banco é uma agência do Banco Postal, uma agência dos Correios. São todos focos estratégicos que mudam ah, os Correios com uma visão de diversificação de produtos, de ah, minimizar os custos da nossa grande rede de atendimento em todo o Brasil. Temos mais de 7.500 pontos de atendimento entre próprios e parcerias com franqueados. Criamos um novo modelo empresarial que estamos em momento de implantação. Enfim, temos, nesse momento, trabalhado de maneira intensa com vistas a que os Correios do Brasil se revitalizem e se encontrem na nova necessidade que a sociedade vê nos Correios do mundo todo, no setor postal, e que, no nosso entendimento, se traduz em duas questões básicas. Sermos um grande, o nosso negócio central, o nosso core business, sermos grandes uh, provedores de logística integrada para a sociedade do nosso país, fornecedores uh, da possibilidade da entrega de encomendas de maneira ágil, eficiente e com credibilidade, e sermos capazes de rentabilizar a nossa grande rede de agências para que continuemos a universalizar os serviços de entrega de encomendas e de correios no Brasil todo, através da diversificação de produtos, seja no setor financeiro, seja na telefonia virtual, seja na venda de seguros e outros uh, produtos similares, e trabalhando com muita atenção ao setor de comércio eletrônico crescente e que o setor postal tem sim vocação para ser o carro-chefe, o motor, o líder desse mercado que cresce anualmente e que, para nós, os Correios do Brasil, seremos sempre atuantes e podemos ser, em cada um dos países, o líder desses mercados de comércio eletrônico, provendo logística integrada e entrega de encomendas com rapidez. Era isso que eu queria falar a todos os senhores e senhoras, agradecer a atenção e me disponibilizar ao debate posteriormente. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Mr. Pinero de Oliveira. Um, this interesting presentation without PowerPoint slides. Important. So, next speaker is Mr. Uh, Ma. Um, he's the Director General of the State Post Bureau in China. Mr. Ma has decades of experience in the post and telecom sector and no doubt that he will have interesting views on e-commerce in China because a lot of things are happening there as we all know, as we all can read and as we all could face. And online ordering of goods is huge and booming in China, no doubt. Mr. Ma will tell us more on collaboratively promoting the fast growth of the parcel industry and the challenges plus measures that need to be taken to facilitate better development of e-commerce. Mr. Ma, you have the floor.演讲大家不要太累了整个邮政体制的改革开放邮政跟快递这个包裹电商数呢
首屈一指。在这个过程中，电子商务对我们这个快递物流贡献最大。在我们一百四十亿的业务量里面，有三分之二是由电子商务带来的。每年增长的五十亿到六十亿的业务量里面，有百分之七十五是电子商务带来的。所以，电子商务呢，对中国邮政业界来讲，是业务的发动机，也是催催动器。那么在发展的过程中呢，我们也创新了很多产品，所以适应了这个发展。现在我们过去的四年，中国的包裹快递的平均价格下降了百分之四十，那么我们这个网点的数量增长了百分之六十，所以现在我们。对老百姓呢，服务就更加贴心了。过去的一年，我们中国的这个呃快递确实创造了很多奇迹。现在中国的快递跟电子商务作为一个供应链，为中国的传统商业的转型提供了非常好的这个这个补充。过去一年，中国这个电商跟快递形成的。销售额已经占到全国的百分之十点七，而且每年正以两个百分点的速度在在在提升。大家可以看看我们每年的双十一那那个图，这是我们再下一个，这是我们中国每年双十一的这个这个图，这个我们每天的业务量超过了呃。一个亿，这个数字呢是我们平时业务量的三倍以上，而且由于我们的业务的发展，确实对我们传统的实业商业带来了很大的冲击。大家可以看看我们图上的这个两张两个图，左面呢是我们中国邮政的飞机，还有我们包裹，现在每天的业务量呢确实是很满的。再看看右边的是我们国家。原来最大的百货商店，现在呢，确实这个这个人流、物流、资金流呢，受到了很大的影响。过去一年，在中国，我们一万平方米以上的大的商业中心已经关闭了一百四十七个，而且这种趋势呢，可能还在发展。就随着我们这个业态的发展，对传统这个商业的零售呢，这个冲击会越来越大。那么在这种情况下，我们的业态下步怎么发展？我们又碰到什么挑战？现在我们碰到最大的问题是，在那么大的业务量的前提下，我们这个网络怎么能平稳、安全、有效的送到用户去？因为现代的呃电子商务跟我传统的邮件，它的业务流是不一样的，传统的邮政流每天都非常有规律，而这个电子商务呢，它弹性很大，它到节日的时候呢，峰值很高，平常的时候呢，也许它不是那么高，是这种情况。说在这种情况下，我们这个网络怎么样有序、有弹性的组织，是给我们带来的一个问题。另外呢，我们还碰到了很多挑战，第一个挑战呢，就是我们这个物流、邮政。快递跟电子商务的协同问题，因为在中国，虽然我们有几千万家这个电子商务商呃电子商务公司，但是我们的平台主要平台呢，主要不到十个，而且前两位市场份额超过百分之九十，所以在这种情况下，电子商务的平台跟物流商的。平台的这个协同关系啊，是非常呃敏感的一个问题。现在因为包裹来自上游，基本上这个标准也来自上游，而且这个规则很多也来自上游，可能对下游、对快递、对邮政的压力比较大。下一步，上下游如何共同克服存在的问题？如何共享发展的成果，是我们
中国电子商务和快递之间协同的要处理的一个问题。第二个问题就是数量、跟质量、跟安全的问题。中国的快递也好，邮政包裹也好，发展很快，这源于这个电子商务的驱动。但是带来的服务问题、安全问题，压力也很大。各位同行可以看看我们。图上这个表，你看过去的四年，虽然我们业务量增长了四倍，但是消费者投诉基本上也有同样的水平，所以大家对我们这个服务呢，还有很多抱怨的。所以下一步呢，既要保证发展的速度，又要平衡这个安全跟服务的问题，是我们带来的一个挑战。第三个挑战呢，是如何平衡？商家跟最终用户的关系问题。中国的电子商务目前大部分采取包邮形式，下游的递送费基本上包裹在电商的这个消费价格这里面，所以对于快递、对于邮政包裹溢价的能力很低。那么上游对价格的强烈需求，跟最终用户对服务的需求呢？形成了很大的对冲，这也是我们下一步要面对的一个挑战。第四个挑战呢，就是我们现在单一服务跟现在客户多元需求，现在对我们带来也非常大的一个挑战。现在随着我们电商在中国的普及，现在除了这个日用品这个电商销售以外，最近对终端、高端。发展比较快，另外除用的、穿的电商以外，从今年开始，对这个吃的要求比较快。这除了要求我们除了提供这个常温的食品之外，还要提供这个呃冷链的这个物流，所以对这个方面呢，对我们下步发展呢也提出了挑战。对这个问题，下步我们怎么办？我们中国对下部战略呢，一个保持中高速，第二个呢继续推进这个中高端向中高端迈进。我们讲到二零二零年，我们做了一个规划，我们整个快递从现在今年的不到两百亿，要翻一翻，要到五百亿件。这个基本上世界今年可能我们包括邮政。包括我们快递所有的个规模。第二个呢，我们推动社会这个销售额两万亿美元。第三个呢，可能我们还要提供大量的社会就业，有三百万人，所以这个要做很多工作。为了围绕这个目标呢，我们下一步呢采取几个措施：一个从网络方面，从广度、深度不断延伸；我们一个方面呢，要向农村进军；第二个呢，要推进。跨境，特别跟国外各位同行的合作，把中国的产品变成，呃，中国的工厂变成这个中国的市场，向这个目标迈进。第三个，我们可能还要跟制造业结合，把这个市场可能做得更深更透一点。第二个呢方面呢，我们在软件方面做大的提升，利用大数据，利用这个移动互联网，还有利用这个无人机、高铁。把我们的网络进行优化。第三个呢，我们就就推进这个邮政包裹跟快递包裹跟其他各个行业的高度融合。一方面，我们邮政企业网络之间的融合，还有邮政跟我们超市、社区的融合，跟金融机构的融合。另外，我在末端可能要配备大量的无人机。最后一个措施呢，可能我们就是在政府跟企业方面要共同构建一个好的生态，因为现在我们做这个电子商务，特别做跨境，跟政府部门、海关部门要碰到的问题也比较多。另外，在我们安全方面，政府也有很多需求，所以在这个企业跟政府方面，把这个行业的生态呢构建更好点，共同推进行业的发展。最近呢，我们中国的总理对我们这个行业呢给予很高的期望
，对我们中国的邮政业做了一个最新的定位。我们过去只是送信、送包裹，他讲还不够。李克强是经济学家，对我们这个行业的定位呢，给了三个定位，作为我们这个现代服务业的关键产业。第二个，作为我们这个推动商业流通。刺激消费升级的关键行业，第三个推动这个作为我们物流的领军产业，我们中国的邮政业正为这个三个目标来推进、来演进，也希望各国来参加中国的邮政业现代化建设。我们中国邮政业界呢，也愿意跟世界各国的邮政业界呢加强合作。谢谢大家。Thank you, Mr. Ma. Um, interesting views on what is happening in China, and we will certainly come back to that in the panel discussion. Our next speaker is Deepak Chopra. He is President and CEO of Canada Post, the largest enabler of trade and commerce in Canada. Under Mr. Chopra's leadership, Canada Post has taken major steps to redefine its role in the increasingly digital economy. And we mentioned before, so he's stopping mail deliveries at home, and probably he will going to say something about this in the speech or later on. Um, so the increasingly digital economy, and we're happy to understand his views on e-commerce as an enabler for postal go growth. So, uh, Mr. Chopra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, we have the presentation. We're really delighted to be here on behalf of Canada Post to talk about cross-border e-commerce. I'm going to talk about the cross-border part of the e-commerce because uh, I think you will hear from speakers and you've heard from speakers. Domestic e-commerce is being handled, I might say, quite well in most jurisdictions. So just to give you a flavor, I think our transaction mail volume is already in the 40% range. So the, the notion that mail is going away is happening and it's real. And I think it's only a matter of time as we see that number continue to shrink. About 20 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, the predictions were coming in that mail volume is going to go down. And finally, I think it's happening. And many people talked about uh, what's going to be the relevance of the postal service if the mail goes away. Pretty relevant question. And as soon as the e-commerce arrived, as soon as the parcel growth arrived, there is a general assumption that postal industry will be okay. And I think it's premature for our industry to assume that parcel will save the day, particularly on the cross-border. That's the area I wanted to spend a little bit more time. For domestic, you've heard reasons, you just heard from Mr. Ma, you heard from Brazil, and if you look at your own countries, there is no doubt in my mind that you're coming up with strategies to compete, to establish products and services that make sense. But I really wanted to focus today on the cross-border. So the question for cross-border that we are struggling with, perhaps collectively, is the rules that were designed 50, 60 years ago, to support a letter mail business, a business where our industry had exclusive privilege, meaning we were the only game in town. So the rules that were designed to support that industry for cross-border letter mail business are no longer relevant to support the cross-border e-commerce. And that is the challenge that we have to figure out together. On the one hand, we have countries who are benefiting from the export of e-commerce packages, packets, small packets. And it is very important that those small businesses that are now participating in the global e-commerce have an avenue to support their international growth. Or certainly the new markets that have been created for small businesses, it is a very important trade enabler that we do through the postal sector. But the challenge is on the receiving end. The receiving end 
of the posts is facing new challenges. You saw some of the packets in the previous chart that are originating from the exporting countries. But those packages, when they're arriving, they're taking a lot longer to deliver to the end user, to the end home. And if that service cannot be insured longer term, then this short-term growth, the short-term success of small businesses in those countries may only be short-lived. I think it's very important for us to understand that we need to find the right balance in terms of supporting growth from small businesses and being able to deliver the product in a reasonable cost. So the cross-border, when I look at the makeup of mail that we see in, in certainly our sorting centers, kind of begs the question to me, is are we satisfied to be the, the network of leftovers? Perhaps a strong statement. And, and I mean that only in the cross-border context. From a domestic perspective, as I mentioned earlier, I think many posts have done a great job and they continue to do a great job. But from a cross-border perspective, we have to figure out how do we create a sustainable business model that both the sender and receiver is happy about. And that's the challenge that I would call upon. I think this is the right platform as we set our strategic priorities for the next Congress. How do we find a balance where the product and service has the quality that consumers are expecting from other carriers? The service and a remuneration system that allows a balance between the sender and the receiver. So those agenda items are very critical for the long-term sustainability. I think otherwise there is a danger that we may, over time, ourselves reduce the business opportunity for the cross-border commerce and just focus on our domestic markets, which would be a great opportunity lost for post postal sector that has tremendous opportunity in front of us. So I wanted to keep my remarks brief and focused on the cross-border. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chopra. You made some interesting statements, and I'm sure we will come back on that in the panel debate. Leftovers is something that is in my mind, yeah? the network of the leftovers. I will come back on that. Notre prochain orateur est Philippe Wall, PDG de La Poste en France. Philippe était CEO de Royal Bank of Scotland pour la France, la Belgique et le Luxembourg avant d'être nommé président de la Banque Postale et directeur général adjoint du groupe La Poste en 2011. En septembre 2013, Philippe Wall est nommé par le président de la République sous proposition du gouvernement, président directeur général de La Poste, SA, et il succède à Jean-Paul Bailly. La France n'est pas numéro un de l'e-commerce en Europe, mais fait des progrès rapides. Il ne peut pas en être autrement. Philippe Pâle, en tant que PDG de La Poste, y compris DPD, a une vision claire sur l'e-commerce en France, l'Europe et l'international. Monsieur Val. s'il vous plaît. Monsieur le Premier ministre de Côte d'Ivoire, qui présidait cette assemblée, monsieur le directeur général de l'Union postale, Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, Mesdames et Messieurs, je ne vais pas dans cet exposé aborder mes trois convictions stratégiques sur le développement des postes. Je ne vais pas vous dire que je pense que le e-commerce est la nouvelle frontière des postes, que les postes ont la mission d'être des acteurs majeurs de la mutation numérique dans nos pays, ni que les banques postales sont une grande partie de l'avenir de nos postes. Je voudrais au contraire vous donner des éléments très concrets et opérationnels de ce que représente l'e-commerce en France, en Europe et la façon dont nous le voyons pour l'ensemble du monde. En France d'abord, l'e-commerce a représenté en 2013 56 milliards d'euros de chiffre d'affaires, 600 millions de colis et la croissance de ce segment de marché est de 12%. C'est donc 
une partie du business qui est en très forte croissance. Quelle est la demande des clients français La demande concrète, c'est plus de simplicité. Et donc, pour un client de l'e-commerce en France, la petite lettre, le colis, l'express, ce sont tous des produits du e-commerce. C'est la raison fondamentale pour laquelle, depuis le 1er janvier 2015, nous avons décidé que tout produit qui faisait moins de 3 cm d'épaisseur et très livré en tant qu'objet de courrier et tout produit au-dessus de 3 cm en tant que produit de colis pour simplifier la présentation pour les consommateurs. C'est quelque chose que l'e-commerce nous a poussé à simplifier et à faire. Il en est de même en matière de distribution. Bien sûr, à l'intérieur de la Poste française, tout le monde préférerait que la distribution des produits de l'e-commerce se fasse par les facteurs et les bureaux de poste, c'est-à-dire par les canaux de distribution qui existent. Ce n'est pas nécessairement ce que souhaitent les clients et nous devons donc nous adapter à ce que souhaitent les clients. Qu'avons-nous fait en France Eh bien, c'est très simple. Nous avons déployé sur notre territoire 7000 boutiques relais, des pick-up stores, dans lesquels les clients viennent chercher les colis quand ils le désirent, en dehors de leur domicile et en dehors des bureaux de poste. Nous en aurons plus de 15 000 en Europe, j'y reviendrai. Le deuxième développement qui est lié à l'e-commerce, c'est que nous sommes en train de développer un réseau de consignes connectées avec Néopost, et je sais que Wagner Pignero, le patron de la Poste brésilienne, réfléchit lui-même à développer un tel réseau de consignes. Quelle est l'idée Elle est très simple. Permettre aux gens, en dehors de leur domicile, dans les grands domaines de passage, les gares, les aires de passage, les centres commerciaux, d'aller chercher avec un code, un colis, dans une consigne qui est connectée et qui répond aux besoins du client. C'est une innovation qui a été stimulée par le e-commerce. Troisième innovation stimulée par le e-commerce, le produit Predict, qui a été développé par nos équipes britanniques, qui consiste à envoyer un message le jour précédent la livraison au client pour lui demander à quelle heure et à qui il souhaite que nous livrions le colis. Et ainsi, le client a la possibilité de déterminer une fenêtre d'une heure pendant laquelle il va être livré. Ces trois innovations montrent bien à quel point l'e-commerce va bouleverser à la fois la gamme des produits et aussi les modes de distribution traditionnels de nos postes. Je le disais, cette innovation de prédict, la prédiction de la livraison, a été apportée par les équipes européennes de la Poste. C'est la raison pour laquelle je voudrais maintenant vous parler de ce que nous faisons à l'intérieur du continent européen. En Europe, dans l'ensemble de l'Europe, il y a plus de 300 milliards d'euros pour le marché du e-commerce et il est en croissance de 17%. C'est bien l'avenir des postes européennes qui se joue à cet endroit-là. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous avons écouté la volonté de la Commission de l'Union européenne d'accélérer le développement du e-commerce, de favoriser la création d'acteurs européens du e-commerce et que dans le cadre de IPC, nous avons construit un réseau qui est en train de se mettre en place et qui s'appelle ECIP, qui est le moyen pour nous de doter les consommateurs européens 
les e-commerçants européens d'un réseau de traçabilité et de contrôle de très haut niveau. Il sera totalement opérationnel à la fin de cette année. C'est un engagement absolument considérable de toutes les postes européennes et ça a exigé évidemment de très forts investissements financiers, de très forts investissements technologiques pour un réseau qui fournira une base de référence au e-commerce dans l'ensemble de l'Europe. Et pour nous, à travers nos opérateurs, qui aujourd'hui sont regroupés sous la marque DPD, DPD en anglais, c'est dans les 40 pays de notre présence un réseau qui sera utilisé au quotidien pour le service à la fois du colis B2C, B2B et aussi plus globalement pour les services postaux. On le voit là encore, c'est le e-commerce qui nous a poussé à accélérer notre marche en Europe. Alors du côté maintenant international, au niveau mondial, je crois que il faut bien voir que ICIP sera une référence, mais que fondamentalement, nous aurons besoin du réseau e-compro de l'UPU. Il n'y a pas de contradiction entre ces réseaux. Nous avons besoin pour communiquer et échanger avec la totalité des membres de l'UPU, du travail de l'UPU, de ce lieu de coopération et de construction d'un nouveau réseau et très clairement, e-compro correspond à cette volonté que nous avons de coopération. Il est complémentaire de ce que nous avons réalisé dans la coopérative IMS. Il est très clairement aussi la nouvelle étape que nous allons franchir ensemble. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous pensons que les différentes communautés de réponse à l'e-commerce que ce soit IPC, que ce soit le Cala Post Group, KPG, que ce soit l'UPU, sont sur la base de la coopération qui a lieu dans cette assemblée et à travers l'UPU, la bonne réponse à ce qui est, de mon point de vue, la grande frontière des postes dans les dix années à venir, c'est-à-dire l'e-commerce. Et au moment de conclure, je voudrais à la fois remercier notre modérateur, le directeur général de l'Union et aussi nos amis ivoiriens pour avoir si bien organisé cette conférence stratégique. Mesdames et messieurs, merci de votre attention. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Wow. Another good presentation with a lot of topics that will trigger for sure some intervention and discussion afterwards in the panel debate. Notre prochain orateur, oratrice, je m'excuse, est Anne Mirou, directeur de la division de la technologie et de la logistique à la CNUSET, la conférence des Nations unies sur le commerce et le développement. Elle est responsable des activités dans le domaine de l'innovation et de la technologie pour le développement, les transports et la facilitation du commerce. Sans doute, le CNUSET et Anne Mirou ont une vue très claire sur l'importance de l'e-commerce au niveau mondial pour l'économie en général et les postes en particulier. Madame Mirou, s'il vous plaît. Mesdames et messieurs les participants, tout d'abord, je souhaite vous indiquer le plaisir que j'ai à participer à cette réunion et bien évidemment à partager avec vous certaines des perspectives de la CNUSED sur le rôle du système postal dans le développement du commerce électronique. Le domaine même du commerce électronique, c'est un, un, un sujet sur lequel la CNUSED s'est penchée depuis déjà, je dirais, une quinzaine d'années, puisque nous avons euh, le premier rapport que nous avons euh, établi, c'est le premier rapport en fait des organisations internationales sur ce sujet, précisément sur la question du commerce électronique dans le euh, pays en développement, nous l'avons publié en l'an 2000. Tout récemment, il y a à peine deux semaines, nous avons lancé, disons, une, 
une mise à jour en quelque sorte de ce rapport de 2010 et les perspectives, bien évidemment, les questions qui étaient posées étaient d'une envergure tout à fait différente. Le sujet de ce rapport, euh, qui est le rapport sur l'économie de l'information 2015, sous titre « Unlocking the potential of e-commerce for developing countries », inclut un certain nombre de constatations et voire de recommandations qui, ont une, disons, qui sont particulièrement euh, appropriées euh, au domaine du secteur postal. Je préciserai ici, ou plutôt je voudrais reconnaître, la contribution de l'UPU à l'élaboration de cet ouvrage et la collaboration tout à fait euh, agréable et utile que nous avons eue avec cette organisation. Je, je ne parlerai pas... Enfin, de, 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 de la question dont, dont de la question même de, de la pourquoi le commerce électronique bien que ce soit finalement ce qui est derrière les débats dans une perspective de développement économique pour les pays en développement le commerce électronique offre aujourd'hui des opportunités réelles et c'est justement là peut-être que une politique de commerce électronique est aussi une politique de services postaux il y a une synergie entre les deux au niveau macroéconomique pour les pays de, de cons considérer ces deux blocs en même temps le commerce électronique offre des opportunités, mais il ne faut pas oublier qu'il a aussi un certain nombre de risques. Je, tout le monde, disons, est, est au courant de nos jours des activités de cybercrime, d'activités frauduleuses. Euh, par exemple, il est estimé qu'en 2012, environ 3 milliards et demi de dollars ont été perdus en termes de revenus pour les fournisseurs euh, en raison de la fraude euh, online. Et surtout, ce qui est grave, c'est que les euh, cybercrimes euh, augmentent euh, en volume et en, disons, euh, atteinte ou euh, couverture géographique, plutôt. Il y a aussi d'autres éléments qui sont importants quand on parle euh, d'une perspective de services postaux, et je penserai en, en particulier à l'impact du commerce électronique sur la concurrence et sur justement la façon dont les petites et moyennes entreprises peuvent profiter de ce nouveau médium de communication et dans quelle perspective. Et puis aussi, il y a tout l'aspect des revenus fiscaux. Comment faire en sorte pour un certain nombre de, de gouvernements Le commerce électronique, c'est aussi un peu synonyme de difficulté à récupérer un certain nombre de taxes. Donc ce sont des éléments qui sont euh, toujours à l'esprit des décideurs politiques quand ils euh, touchent à la question du commerce électronique et partant aux différents paramètres de ce secteur. On a mentionné à différentes reprises, et c'est un peu l'objectif de médias positifs, elles sont, disons, illustratives, euh, la remarquable expansion du commerce électronique sur la décennie euh, précédente. Il est estimé, par exemple, que le euh, B2B commerce a dépassé les 15 trillions de dollars en 2015. D'ailleurs, environ les trois quarts de ce montant euh, étaient représentés par seulement quatre pays, les États-Unis, le Royaume-Uni, le Japon et la Chine. Donc les montants sont faramineux, B2B évidemment. Et puis on a aussi l'aspect B2C, donc business to consumer, qui comme on peut le voir sur ce schéma est beaucoup, beaucoup plus petit, même s'il est en expansion relativement rapide. Ceci étant, c'est en particulier dans le domaine des relations business to consumer que particulièrement le service postal a un rôle important à jouer. En termes de perspective géographique et mondiale, je voudrais souligner, et nous l'avons d'ailleurs vu grâce à la présentation qui nous a été faite par le représentant de la Poste chinoise, les chiffres pour la Chine sont remarquables. Et il n'est donc pas étonnant que la Chine soit aujourd'hui le marché le plus important en termes de e-commerce B2C. Si vous voulez montrer peut-être les... Voilà. Merci, je vous remercie. Euh, comme vous pouvez le constater, donc, on a un certain nombre, on a des différences géographiques euh, assez euh, importantes. Ceci étant conduite par l'Asie, la part des pays en développement et en transition devrait augmenter et passer à environ 40% euh, du euh, B2C 
globale en d'ici trois ans environ pour, pour 2018. Et en comparaison, si on prend un continent comme le continent africain, à la fois l'Afrique et le Moyen-Orient, les deux réunis euh, arrivent à peine à représenter 2% du commerce mondial B2C. Donc il y a des euh, très très larges différences au, au niveau des régions et bien évidemment au niveau des pays. Et d'ailleurs, et c'est la, la prochaine diapositive, voilà, cette diapositive, si vous voulez, a un petit peu pour objectif de, mon, de vous montrer les, les, vraiment les, les deux extrémités sur la base, bien évidemment, des données qui nous sont disponibles et de, voir, de comparer justement la part des individus qui achètent des produits online. Et on voit bien évidemment dans la partie qui est la partie gauche de la diapositive, ce sont plutôt des pays en développement et la partie à droite, ce sont des pays développés avec quelques pays en développement, particulièrement dans le haut du panier, je dirais, ou de la barrière de GDP, comme le Singapour et la Corée. Alors évidemment, les différences sont substantielles, ceci étant euh, la perspective pour les firmes et pour les consommateurs, euh, pour, dans les pays en, en développement, de participer au, au commerce électronique, cette perspective est en augmentation. Et pour cela, il y a un certain nombre de raisons qui sont relativement connues, mais disons les plus, euh, les plus marquantes sont bien, bien évidemment la situation en termes de connectivité, parce qu'on parle beaucoup de e-commerce ces cinq dernières années, et la progression est remarquable. Elle y est très fortement liée, bien évidemment, à l'expansion euh, considérable euh, du téléphone mobile dans les pays en développement, mais aussi, dans une certaine mesure, le développement des médias sociaux et l'utilisation, bien évidemment, de l'Internet. Un, un deuxième facteur d'expansion y compris dans les régions en développement, c'est le développement de nouvelles applications e-commerce, de nouvelles plateformes, mais aussi de nouvelles solutions de paiement. Et c'est un paramètre qui a déjà été souligné à plusieurs reprises comme un des peut-être obstacles au développement du commerce électronique. Et non seulement le développement des cartes de crédit, mais plus encore les solutions de paiement mobile sont une source, une possibilité, une opportunité, une facilitation plutôt d'expansion du commerce électronique. Et enfin, le développement de nouveaux services locaux e-commerce dans les pays en développement. Ok, très bien. Donc, je vais euh, me passer assez rapidement à, disons que, euh, dans les pays euh, en développement, on a vu que le, le commerce électronique est en expansion. L'utilisation de l'Internet par les petites entreprises reste cependant très, très limitée. Les raisons sont nombreuses. D'abord, la, la possibilité d'avoir accès à des services IT euh, à coût euh, raisonnable. Mais il y a aussi des problèmes de capacité, euh, de compétences. Et puis enfin, élément crucial, c'est la possibilité d'avoir à disposition des solutions pour la livraison aussi bien online et euh, électronique ou physique. Et c'est là, justement, le, disons, l'élément le, clé qui fait que les, po que les postes sont dans des, un des acteurs fondamentaux du système euh, et de l'écosystème e-commerce. Je mentionnerai euh, rapidement euh, un des euh, index que la CNUSED a établi, qui est de voir dans quelle mesure les, les pays sont prêts, c'est le e-commerce, B2C e-commerce, Redinex et Index. Et cet index a quatre paramètres. Le premier, c'est... Vous voulez venir en arrière, s'il vous plaît Merci. Le pourcentage des individus qui utilisent l'Internet, le pourcentage aussi qui ont une carte de crédit, bien que cela puisse être modifié à terme, euh, le, disons une, un paramètre ou une donnée qui euh, traduit l'existence de serveurs euh, sur euh, Internet sur. Et puis ce qui nous euh, intéresse aujourd'hui particulièrement, c'est le pourcentage de la population qui ont euh, un service euh, postal qui délivre les paquets euh, à la maison. Et on voit qu'il bien évidemment qu'il y a une euh, corrélation extrêmement importante entre la expansion de l'e-commerce et en particulier cette dernière, ce, ce dernier. Paramètres. Par exemple, il est intéressant de noter que dans les pays développés, environ euh, disons, 100% des gens 
ont un accès euh, postal, service, at home. Dans, en Afrique, c'est moins de 40%. Et même dans certains pays d'Afrique, euh, 10% de la population n'a accès à aucun service. Donc on voit, disons, cette dichotomie de situation qui explique aussi, qui est un élément à prendre à compte pour les autorités politiques dans une perspective de développement de commerce électronique. Je conclurai avec les recommandations de l'ACNUSED. L'une d'elles est particulièrement importante aujourd'hui. En fait, c'est euh, la nécessité de considérer le système postal comme une infrastructure cruciale et essentielle. Et quand je veux dire le système postal, je pense euh, à cette euh, comment dire, problématique qui a été mentionnée, qui est que faire pour euh, régler cette contradiction entre euh, l'accès à des services à des prix raisonnables pour toute la population et toutes les entreprises d'un pays, et puis d'autre part, l'accès à des services particulièrement sophistiqués et qui re, re, de, répondent aux besoins des entreprises modernes. Une deuxième recommandation de la CNUSED, c'est de se pencher peut-être sur le système de l'adresse dans les pays en développement. C'est un obstacle dans un certain nombre de pays, justement, où ce système n'est pas, euh, pas développé, voire pas du tout au point. Et puis le troisième domaine, qui est un domaine qui tient à cœur particulièrement à la CNUSED, c'est pour ce qui commerce, concerne le commerce euh, international, euh, toute la question de la facilité du commerce. On en a parlé à plusieurs reprises, mais je voudrais souligner particulièrement cette difficulté auquel se trouvent confrontés importateurs et exportateurs, qui est la synergie entre le système postal et le système des douanes. À cet égard, je soulignerai, enfin, disons, disons j'ai le plaisir d'indiquer que euh, nous, à la CNUSED, nous travaillons sur ce qu'on appelle un mémorandum of understanding entre euh, UPU et euh, notre système d'automatisation des douanes à Sikuda. L'objectif de cette, ce partenariat, c'est de... Euh, développer ou de faciliter un échange de données et surtout l'interface entre précisément le, postal, le système postal et le système douanier. Et en faire dernier point, euh, on ne peut envisager d'amélioration, euh, et je, parle en partie, je pense en particulier aux pays en développement euh, dans, dans ce contexte, sans prendre en compte euh, l'ensemble de l'économie. Autrement dit, il, faut, il y a un certain nombre de questions euh, qui ont besoin de, de de réponse. Elle concerne l'infrastructure IT et en particulier tout ce qui concerne le haut débit. Il y a encore une très grande fracture digitale, comme l'a souligné à plusieurs reprises l'Organisation internationale de, 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 des télécommunications. Le développement des compétences et de l'expertise dans le secteur privé, mais aussi dans le secteur public. Et puis l'utilisation du, du, du e-government services, qui est un élément peut-être de développement justement euh, aussi bien pour, disons, pour tous les acteurs. En conclusion, le paysage de l'e-commerce est en train d'évoluer de façon extrêmement rapide. Et c'est dans ce contexte que nous, à la CNUSED, nous sommes persuadés que les postes nationales vont continuer à jouer un rôle particulièrement important. Je vous remercie. Je remercie Madame Mirou. Avec des messages clairs du CNUSED. Et nous allons continuer avec notre dernier speaker d'aujourd'hui. Et nous avons encore le plaisir d'avoir un customer parmi nous. Au premier, nous avons eBay. Et maintenant, nous avons Jumia. 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 Ok. Nous avons un petit changement dans le programme. Donc, Jérémy Doutet a été annoncé, mais il a été co-CEO de Jumia. Donc, il est avantage d'avoir co-CEO, c'est que les autres co-CEO sont ici. Donc, je vais vous donner un petit changement. And the advantage of having co-CEOs is that the other co-CEO is here. So uh, there's no change in title, there's only change in person. So Nicolas Martin will uh, present us um, their views on what is happening uh, with uh, Jumia in, in Africa. It's a, it's a marketplace, it's an e-tailer. Um, and uh, Nicolas, he was previously a McKinsey um, guy, if I can say so. He went to MBAs in INSEAD and so on. And well, they are working on their way, on their path to make something big from Cumia. I heard Africa only 2% in e-commerce global trade, so we have a lot of work still yes. to do. So please explain Yet. us. Thank you. Yet, only 2%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And it's a, you know, it's a pleasure to see the, your 
the opening of your minds to invite actually a, const a consumer and a customer, and not only a post operator. Uh, and I would also like to specifically um, thank the Nigerian representation, of which I wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, I would like to very quickly touch upon the three points that I, we prepared for, I prepared for you. Um, just maybe introduce you very quickly to what is Jumia, because most of you might not know what it is and what it stands for. Um, from our standing points, where does Africa stand in terms of, of challenges regarding e-commerce? And therefore, and it will be my third point, um, how do we plan to overcome it? And how do we see and what are the innovations that are coming our way um, in this African continent that is actually far more vibrant than most of you might suspect? Um, so what is Jumia? Jumia is an e-commerce that was founded by a German incubator in 2012. Um, it started in Nigeria and it's now covering over 12 countries in a very relaxed definition of what is Africa because it stems from Senegal up to Bangladesh. Um, so, and, and it's actually an operator that is, um, I would say to put it short, an Amazon-like, um, even though more and more the, the successes that we see coming in Asia um, pushes us to, to revise the model and the, and the operating model we have for e-commerce closer to an Alibaba or even closer to a flip card that is definitely for us, I think, the best referring point we have coming from India, uh, applicable to Africa. Uh, in terms of, um, of size, so Jumia is only two, point, two and a half years old. Um, last Black Friday, we moved around in one day 100,000 packages for Nigeria and 200,000 packages for Africa as a whole. Uh, we plan to have two million this Black Friday, this December, and 20 million, the following one in 18 months. That's the kind of growth that we are facing for e-commerce, uh, something around multiplying the size by 10 every year. Um, <clears throat> right now, we have also Jumia as fully integrated in most of its country, its delivery and logistic services. Because I didn't found in the operator locally the kind of services that I wanted to have and the kind of services that my consumer and my customer wanted. I bought myself vans, I bought myself pickups, I bought myself bikes, and I deliver myself. Right now, Jumia all over Africa is at more than a thousand vehicles, and we are gonna double to triple that size up until the end of the year. Might not sound much to the very esteemed predecessor in my, uh, at that podium, um, but let me tell you, over the last year, I gained a lot of respect for what you do because it's actually quite difficult and quite complicated to operate on its own. Um, Africa is therefore a continent full of challenges for, for us and for an e-commerce in general. Um, and that's why the opportunities are also as tremendous. Um, also, to, to, to give you a sense before I go into the challenges, the the size of the opportunity is way bigger in proportion in Africa than it is in Europe, in China, or in the US. Just because the offline competition and the offline retail is so unstructured yet that actually retail is most likely going to leapfrog from its current state to a more e-commerce based like state. Right now in the US, maybe e-commerce is representing 10 to 15 percent of retail as a share. I suspect and we suspect that for Africa it will be closer to 30 to 50 percent in the next five years. Um, also to give you another sense, there is roughly 500 times more square meter of offline retail space in the US than there is in Nigeria. There, in a 20 million people city like Lagos, there is three malls, two and a half to be honest, if we compare to European or Western standards. Uh, therefore, e-commerce is not only a revolution um, in, uh, in Africa, it's just a creation of something completely new, which doesn't have to face the kind of competition that, you might, uh, that Amazon or even Alibaba might have faced in their environment. Uh, so, 
the challenges that we are facing, especially, especially the challenges that are more I'm sorry, uh, relevant to you, are obviously we have a limited pool of operators that we can trust and rely in terms of performance, but also a limited pool of operators in terms of capacity. Um, I'm already myself almost saturating all the private operators in Nigeria as of now. Um, obviously, the second uh, challenge, as you might find, is a, is a natural one. Infrastructure, we mentioned it, roads are the obvious ones, but also the addressing system that in Africa is not as developed as you might have uh, in Europe or in the West. And finally, I think it would be a big misunderstanding to think that the, the African consumer is any less sophisticated or any less demanding than any other of your and or our end customer. Um, and I would even argue that given the ecosystem and the environment and the lack of trust that e-commerce might face in those countries, we have to go the extra mile and provide even more services um, to those consumers. To give you a sense uh, of what it might uh, look like 80% uh, of our business is cash on delivery, meaning that you place an order on the website, you don't pay for anything, you don't use electronic payment, you pay only cash when you receive the product to the, to the delivery agent. Another example of service that we are providing for them is the ability to test and try, especially for fashion, at delivery. So the delivery agent will come and will wait for 15 minutes for you to try your dress, your pants, your shoes, to see if it fits. And if it doesn't fit, give it back to you directly. Um, meaning that we also change the way we do commerce with our customer. Uh, for instance, now we are automatically, when you place an order on, in some countries in Jumia, uh, placing this side plus, the size plus one and the size minus one. So when you order a dress, three are coming your way. Most often, for, how can I say, women customer, it's actually quite useful. They tend to slightly underestimate their relative size. <laughs> but it's better for us. It avoids us to do what we were doing before, which is deliver, disappoint the customer, come back to pick up, and retrieve the item. Uh, when facing or, or considering all those challenges, um, we are convinced at Jumia, and we because not only convinced because of faith, but because we see it happening, that it will what regarding logistic services and postal services, Africa will observe the same dynamic as it has happened for telecommunication 10 to 15 years ago, which is a massive leapfrog. If you go in Lagos today, there is a better 4G access in terms of data network than in Paris. Because they didn't have to install fiber, they didn't have to install DSL, they didn't have to install all those stuff that we had and that we are actually reusing. Um, and they went directly for the last version of the technological jump and installed already and were at the forefront of it. Um, and what we can see is already for logistics and postal services in Africa, it will most likely be the same. Um, What we, I sum up then. Um, just when I'm saying, and I will try to keep it short, uh, the level of innovation that you might see here in Africa is actually almost as ambitious and, uh, and exciting that you can see in the US. For instance, Jumia right now is already working on a partnership that took five years for, for Amazon to develop. Amazon is developing a partnership with Uber to have extra express delivery a delivery in one hour. Um, and we are doing the same with taxi operators. And that interconnection with, inter with taxi platform is actually providing that level of services in Lagos. Um, we are also partnering much more closely with telecom operator. And not having telecom operator in, as in the picture for you, I think, would be a big blind spot. Because all the communication to customer and the challenges that you were raising about Following your package step by step, right now, it's compli it was complicated to operate. Um, Jumia has partnered is, and is actually 33% owned by MTN, the biggest telecom operator, 
uh, that is providing that level of services and that connectivity to the packages that we are offering. Um, finally, when we come to addressing the kind of innovation that we are also seeing is that we are, op we are, we are gonna launch in Q3, Q4, a service where you can indicate where you live, but you don't have any postal address, but you can also take a picture of the door step of what you want to see, and you send it and you upload it at checkout. So the driver will actually, on his mobile app and his smartphone, look at the door uh, and know which door to actually knock in um, to actually get to the address of the package. So if you thought that Africa was not burgeoning in innovation, I hope that those 10 minutes gave you another idea and made you change your mind. And thank you again for having me and having the patience of listening to me. Thank you, Nicolas. Very interesting presentation. And um, we now have time for a panel debate, I think. Uh, yeah, a lot of questions certainly coming from my mind if I hear you all speaking. And for me, always the rule, customer first. So, Nicolas, I will go to you first. Yeah? You mentioned clearly that you said we set up our own distribution logistics. Yeah? I think that's a very important message here for this room. Yeah? That means that somewhere something's failed. Yeah? What have you done first? Did you try first the postal system and then decided, or was it an immediate decision to go immediately to a own distribution system? I think that's important to know and understand for the people um, here. Well, you're putting me in a tough spot because they have been very nice to actually invite me. And well, <laughs> uh, let's just say that in terms of timelines and delivery, um, the level of performance in some of the country we operate were not the one we were expecting. Uh, sometimes some ratio of losses above 40% um, and some timelines on average which were two or three weeks to get a simple package delivered. So, What's your service delivery today? In how many days do we deliver? So right now on our own we deliver in, uh, so I'm going to give you Nigerian examples uh, but the performance is relatively the same all across countries. The first attempt is between two to three days in Lagos three to four outside Lagos, outside big cities, and the total fulfillment, because we make several attempts often due to the cash on delivery, where we need to actually meet the customer to have the exchange of cash happening, you have to add maybe one, one and a half day on, a, on those okay. averages. Short delivery times, cash on delivery, yeah. reliable distribution. As much what, as what, we can. What in terms of price, was the post cheaper than your actual uh, setup in organization or in operations? In or terms not. of shipping fee, yes, but when you lose 40% of the package... That's true. Okay. So yeah. I think an important message here, I think, for many African posts mm -hmm. in the room, if you don't perform, if you don't get the things right, this will happen. Yeah? That's what I hear here. Um, Deepak Chopra, you said we are becoming a network of leftovers. Can you comment on that? I couldn't have commented on that better than what Jumia has already done. I think that's, the context is changing for e-commerce. I think everybody jumped on it five years ago thinking this is it. And it may be it for a short period of time, but let's fast forward five years. Jumia has figured out that in developing countries we have a challenge because if you have to move from one country to another, we don't have visibility, security, tracking, and reliability. Let's, that's today. Let's look forward. Philippe talked about parcel lockers. Large platforms, Amazons and so on, they are doing their direct deliveries. So there is a real danger of disintermediation. And what would be left is what no one wants to deliver in remote villages and remote areas, which is very expensive. So the problem we were trying to solve of the declining letter mail, we then inherit the problem of declining parcels. So what I mean by that is we have to, because in this market we are competing. This is, this is a market where Jumia can very quickly set up their own network. Uber can partner with anybody they like. So in this market, if our network is not up to scratch, we're gonna be left behind. What's the most important thing we need to solve together here in the room? The exchange between our countries 
have to meet the basic criteria of quality, affordability, and technology. And, and they're all interconnected, whether it's, it's, it's the customs, whether it's technology, whether it's tracking. But these, we have to be able to offer some basic features at affordable rates that at least can compete, uh, particularly in the low value transactions. Okay, we're going to interrupt the panel discussion because there is an intervention from France, if I'm not wrong, and they need to catch their plane. So please be uh, short and precise. Yeah. <laughs> Je voudrais, tout d'abord, je voudrais tout d'abord remercier les organisateurs de cette conférence euh, et saluer tout particulièrement la présidence euh, ivoirienne de la conférence. Euh, je voudrais également en quelques mots souligner l'importance que, que la France apporte, accorde euh, aux travaux menés au sein de l'UPU euh, pour accompagner les mutations du secteur postal euh, et euh, tout autant en s'appuyant sur les valeurs d'universalité et de solidarité Euh, qui permettent à tous les pays membres à la fois d'en être les acteurs et les bénéficiaires de ces changements. Alors, je voudrais maintenant, pour en venir au, au commerce électronique, qui est le sujet du panel, beaucoup a été dit euh, par les panélistes, euh, avec des exemples très concrets, très précis. Euh, je voudrais pour ma part apporter un, un cours euh, contrepoint euh, sur euh, les éléments euh, qui peuvent être attendus des gouvernements en faveur du développement du e-commerce. Euh, Donc quel rôle attendre des gouvernements pour cela Alors bien sûr, il y a euh, un point qui est la base de tout, qui sont les investissements euh, pour les réseaux eux-mêmes, les réseaux de communication électronique. Euh, donc investir et favoriser les investissements euh, dans ces réseaux. Lutter contre la fracture numérique, ça a été évoqué. Euh, et d'ailleurs, je dois dire que j'ai été très favorablement impressionné par euh, les éléments et les chiffres donnés ce matin par la Côte d'Ivoire. Un second élément, c'est également quelque chose qui a été mentionné à de multiples reprises, c'est de jouer sur la confiance des consommateurs. Alors, beaucoup de, de solutions doivent être apportées par les opérateurs eux-mêmes, et nous en avons eu euh, plusieurs exemples très intéressants. Euh, notre conviction, c'est que les gouvernements doivent également jouer un rôle dans ce processus, afin, euh, Quel rôle Quel rôle afin d'apporter un cadre qui soit connu de tous, qui soit euh, à la fois clair et sécurisant, qui donne les règles du jeu, Pour les consommateurs. Alors c'est le rôle du régulateur C'est le rôle des gouvernements et des régulateurs. Les gouvernements peuvent fixer les règles, le régulateur les met en œuvre de manière, de manière plus précise et dans les cas concrets. D'accord. Et donc ces informations d'abord sont les informations sur les services donnés, sur euh, la transparence sur les protections dont les consommateurs peuvent bénéficier, contre des pratiques déloyales, sur les recours dont ils peuvent bénéficier. Et ça ce sont des points euh, extrêmement importants pour construire euh, la confiance. Euh, pour, en citer, pour citer encore deux exemples et deux, deux secteurs allez-y, clés, allez-y, parce que les données encore... personnelles, ouais. les informations sur les données personnelles et la manière dont elles peuvent être euh, préservées pour les consommateurs, c'est un point important. Euh, et puis euh, des solutions d'identité numérique qui euh, sont apportées par, par les opérateurs, mais dans lesquelles aussi les gouvernements peuvent, appor- peuvent avoir un rôle pour fixer un cadre là encore et les faire connaître euh, mieux de la part des consommateurs. Pour conclure, le dernier point, mais pas le moindre, c'est que les gouvernements apportent leur soutien aux travaux qui sont menés au sein de l'UPU, car ces travaux sont absolument structurants pour le développement des échanges, et notamment des échanges de commerce électronique sur le plan mondial. Et là, bien sûr, je veux saluer la, la mise en place euh, du, du programme EcomPro, euh, puisque c'est un, c'est un point très important. Euh, okay. voilà. We will talk about EcomPro in a minute. Okay. Thank voilà. you. Thank you for this intervention. We go on with the debate. EcomPro was mentioned. Um, Yeah, Deepak said we are becoming the leftover industry. Um, you see things happening in Africa. EcomPro is on the agenda, is high on the agenda of the UPU. Uh, and Mr. Hussein is here, so he can listen now. Is EcomPro the right thing to do? Is it fast enough? And is going is going well? So I want to hear from I think one, two, three CEOs here in the room uh, who participate, and then also from China. Are we on track with Ecom Pro? Is it the right thing to do? Yes, I told it very rapidly. It's totally uh, useful, and we have to do it now. Okay, Deepak. I would agree with that. It's the okay. right thing. Good evening. Yes, yes. Mr. Ma. Wu Yi is a right choice. Wu Yi is a right choice. As a government, we need to push the digital trade. 因为电子商务能给大家带来很大的便利
，那是我们为什么不推动呢？第二个呢是，随着我们这个行业的转型，电子商务能够带来很多美好的未来，我们不推动干什么的？我倒不太赞同它是个简陋的项目，而是我们要主动作为，主动应对，主动创新，来满足这个需要。另外，对那个政府，怎么？制定这规则的问题，我认为对电子商务啊，我们还有很多未知的东西。现在我们不要什么都不知道，政府就要制制定这个规则，这不符合这个规律。从我们中国的情况来看，现在我们要做的，营造这个生态，推动上下游的合作。第三个政府呢，守住一个底线，安全底线，那个欺诈的底线，侵犯消费者权益的底线。这个才是我们政府该做的东西。在这个前提下，我们探讨一些规则。我要说的。Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Econ Pro is the right thing to do, but I hear also Monsieur Val que vous mentionnez ICIP est en en train de faire à peu près la même chose, pas complètement la même chose. J'entends que vous dites Kahala Post Group. Est-ce que Kahala Post Group est un peu une doublure quelque part de Lupeu ou pas? I can play advocate of the devil here. Are we not duplicating things in the industry? Shouldn't we have one solution? No, nous avons un socle. Le socle, c'est Lupeu et c'est Icom Pro. Et ce socle, sa nature, c'est d'être partagé par nous tous, pour des raisons à la fois de moyens financiers et de complexité des systèmes. ICIP et ce que nous faisons dans KPG sont des solutions qui sont complémentaires et donc ça correspond à des stades différents d'évolution et c'est dans UPU que doit se faire cette coopération. Thank you. In the beginning of my presentation, I asked the question: Who will win the battle of the e-commerce parcel delivery? Will be the post, the integrators, or maybe Alibaba and others. I come back to that question, but before, Monsieur Wall, j'ai encore une question pour vous. Quelque part, vous promouvez la collaboration entre les postes, mais vous avez votre propre réseau de paquets en Europe, quelque part. Et vous n'êtes pas le seul. Deutsche Post a DHL et Royal Mail a GLS. Comment est-ce que ça va ensemble? Parce que quelque part, vous Vous êtes compétiteur, la concurrence des postes dans d'autres pays, mais vous utilisez aussi les réseaux. Explique-nous comment ça marche. Nous savons tous que le business moderne, ce n'est plus simplement la coopération ou plus simplement la compétition, c'est la coopétition, c'est-à-dire des partenariats sur les éléments fondamentaux des socles et des réseaux. Et la capacité à se faire compétition. Et donc, je crois que ce que nous développons dans la pratique, la poste française, c'est la coopétition, coopération fondamentale. Et je l'ai dit au directeur général de l'UPU, notre volonté d'être un membre très actif de la coopération, mais aussi notre capacité à développer le business et à être des compétiteurs. Ok. One question: Who will win the battle? And you can only give one answer and a very short answer. Who will win the battle? Is it uh, <laughs> the post or the integrator or yourself in the delivery? The Alibabas of the world. The Alibabas of the world. Madame Mirou, qui va gagner la bataille? Well, I, I, je ne serai pas aussi, euh, comment dire, aussi euh, déterminé. Je crois qu'il y a encore un rôle pour euh, la, la, la poste publique. D'accord. Très bien, Monsieur Val. Pour moi, c'est très clair. Ce sont les postes réunis ici qui vont gagner la bataille si, si. les conditions de concurrence sont égales avec tout le monde. Parfait. Mr. Chop, Deepak. I think it's too early to tell, but I agree with Mr. Ma that the, the call for action that we are all reaching out to build a network that can compete, that can be reliable. I think we can win that battle. For a portion of it, hopefully for a larger portion of it, but it requires us. Uh, and, and my comments were meant to be provocative, 
to get the debate going. No problem with that. And, and, and that's really uh, going to determine if we can come together, I think we have a shot at it. Mr. Ma, sh short answer, but you know, Alibaba is setting up their own, uh, their own networks also. Who will win the battle? I don't want you to say anything. It's your choice what you say. I'm, I'm only trying to get some answers from the floor.所以呢，最后不在乎今天我们说的，我们对未知十年二十年以后没有一定的事，我们给它预测下。我的答案是，谁创新，谁包容，谁便利，谁就赢得未来。如果我们邮政今天，如果把这个站的定下来，我
I have now one package which is three quarter empty, and carrier are shipping, carrying, flying those empty volumes. I think this is also something to be considered. Can you please wrap up? Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so we have another intervention of uh, Costa Rica. Costa Rica asked for the floor. Gracias, uh, señor Somers. Eh, definitivamente el comercio electrónico es un mercado sumamente exigente donde se exige calidad y precio. Ya lo decía el señor de Yumia, donde definitivamente, pues prácticamente crean sus propias redes, crean sus propias estructuras y el correo se queda atrás. Hoy en día acá en la UPU hablamos del e-compro, hablamos mucho más de comercio electrónico, pero pareciera que en definitiva es tarde, es tarde para los que tal vez no han entendido o tal vez no, no han cambiado la manera en que están haciendo las cosas. ¿Cómo convivir o cómo cambiar una estructura tradicional hecha para entregar encomiendas o inclusive en algunos casos casi que solo para cartas, para hablar hoy en día de comercio electrónico. Yo creo que ese es el gran reto de nosotros como Correos y yo quisiera saber eh, a los panelistas, nos hemos quedado atrás acá en la Unión Postal Universal precisamente para poder discutir y para poder tener esta estructura que el mercado hoy en día está exigiendo. Muchas gracias. Ok, who is going to reply to that? Maybe one CEO, maybe... Deepak, you mentioned leftovers. I heard it again. So I, I, I think it's interesting that the point has come from Jumi and the pride, pride point has been made by Costa Rica. Um, I think this is the forum. UPU is the forum for us to address issues. We have, I believe, the right intellect. We have the capability. I think a lot of capable people represent our respective countries. And um, I think the sense of urgency is what I would like to appeal to, uh, to UPU and to the member countries to, to, get, uh, to get started on some of the initiatives. With regard to is it too late, I think it's never too late. Um, E-commerce is 15% of retail sales in the United States. It's 5% in Canada. It's 2% in Africa. If we believe e-commerce is going to be 20 or 30% of retail in many of the countries, I don't think it's too late. I think we can still, okay. we can still win. <coughs> Thank you for that. I have a question for the IB and for the UPU. We talked about Ecom Pro. When will it be ready? Who can answer me that? Is there somebody who can tell me when Ecom Pro will be ready? I think Wendy is in charge of it, so um, please take the floor and help us a little bit out. Can we have a microphone? Yeah, have to. please push. Thank you. Maybe try another microphone over, over there if it works. The UPU has no microphones, so I don't know. <laughs> Please come, come, come down, come down, come here. July 2015. Okay, it works. <laughs> Sorry, now I'm yelling. Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, the pilot for the e-commerce parcel uh, it should be up and running in July 2015. July 2015, that's pilot. Yes. And then afterwards? From, really, everything from the 1st of January 2016. Sorry? 1st of January 2016. Okay, good. That's fast. Thank you. That's what it should be. There are more questions from the floor. Um, the Netherlands uh, asked the floor. I think IPC also, is that correct? Yeah, okay. So first the Netherlands and then IPC. Netherlands, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I have a question for Mr. Chopra. Um, you mentioned in your presentation also the remuneration issue, and I wonder if you could elaborate on the message you have to the UP UPU community on this issue. I think the issues are very well understood and, and um, widely debated. I think we have to find the right balance between the sender and the receiver country and, um, and, and allow our product to compete not quite at the level that some of the best in class are competing, but allow it to move up from the very low level of service to some level of service, some level of visibility. And I believe consumers are willing to pay for that. Um, I think there's a, there's a gap in the product category where we can introduce a product with, I think Ecom Pro is, is a good start, but certainly we need to look at 
the, the regulations and the tariffs that were developed um, for a different purpose, for a different era. And I think these, these debates have been, uh, have been continuing, so I would encourage uh, the committees to take this issue and find the right balance. It, this is not about uh, win or loss. This is about win-win. Finding the right balance and not necessarily overnight, even if we can have a glide path to working our way through to a more sustainable and a product that has uh, basic features that consumers are actually looking for, I think we can, uh, we can develop this to a more viable uh, cross-border commerce. Okay, thank you very much. First the floor to Chile and then to IPC. So Chile, you have the floor. Lisette Enríquez, Presidenta de Correos de Chile. Eh, yo me quería referir a un problema, digamos, que ha salido acá, lo ha mencionado Nigeria, eh, el representante de Canadá, y que es común a muchos de nosotros y que presenta las dos caras que plantean habitualmente las nuevas tendencias como el comercio electrónico. Por una parte, portadora de grandes oportunidades, por otra, también portadora de desafíos y problemas que conlleva la actualización y modificación de regulaciones, procesos, infraestructura, aspectos financieros y que nos impactan de igual forma a todos los operadores designados. Solo por mencionar qué pasa con Chile. De los envíos postales, el 90% de la carga arribada corresponde a pequeña paquetería internacional eh, por la figura de e-commerce, los PPI. Es decir, aparecen con tratamiento de correspondencia y ya no lo son, son bienes comerciales. Estos envíos de pequeña paquetería inter internacional han crecido entre 2012 y 2014 en un 162%. El monto por pago de última milla que recibimos por concepto de envío postal no cubre el costo real de los crecientes envíos con contenido comercial. El desbalance entre envío de carta versus la pequeña paquetería recibida y despachada tiene actualmente una relación proporcional de 1 es a 15%. Es decir, por cada carta que Chile exporta, estamos recibiendo 15 pequeños paquetes. Los efectos negativos que está generando la situación del e-commerce en los servicios postales de los países en desarrollo y su sostenibilidad financiera puede derivar en limitaciones al crecimiento de ese comercio con consecuencias indeseadas tanto en los países exportadores como importadores. Solo por mencionar algunos efectos que los países estamos enfrentando. Problemas significativos de seguridad y con ello un costo adicional. Costo financiero asociado a los grandes volúmenes de carga sin percibir pagos de los servicios a corto plazo, en especial cuando la carga de llegada supera sustancialmente la carga de salida, desbalance de tráfico. Costo por tratamiento aduanero y bodegaje. Costo de última milla de traslado diferente al de las cartas. Necesidad de nueva infraestructura y una logística específica adecuada a este tipo de productos. Costo terminal diseñado originalmente solo para cartas, no para productos comerciales. Expectativas de calidad diferentes del destinatario final, lo que significa... Okay, can you, can you question, please, panel, eh, voy you a one? hacer una propuesta. En definitiva, se está afectando a toda la línea de distribución, además de generar un desbalance en los volúmenes transados que tenderá a incrementarse en el, en el futuro. Eh, hoy el envío postal de productos del e-commerce continúa rigiéndose por la reglamentación tradicional que rige a los tres servicios básicos contemplados en las actas y reglamentos de la UPU, envíos de correspondencia, encomiendas y EMS. Sin embargo, el tratamiento operativo, comercial y aduanero y financiero, clearing, que requiere el manejo de esa correspondencia especial, es diferente y no comparable con el requerido por la correspondencia propiamente tal o corriente. Queremos hacer, que reconoce, yeah. ya, 
reconocemos que representa un avance importante en esta línea, al menos parcialmente la iniciativa de, France, de Brasil del servicio y compro, eh, pero que no resuelve el tema de los pequeños paquetes. Queremos hacer un llamado a la UPU. Queremos hacer un llamado a la UPU. Considerando esta nueva realidad del e-commerce y los efectos que está trayendo consigo, creemos que es necesario desarrollar una normativa específica de la UPU que reglamente internacionalmente un servicio postal que responda adecuadamente a las necesidades del e-commerce de bienes. Asimismo, que contemple reglas de trato especial y diferenciado para los países en desarrollo, acorde con las capacidades económicas de estos. Sorry, so if you don't come now to the conclusion, ah. I will stop the discussion because sí. you have to make now your proposal. Please, thank you. Estoy haciendo la propuesta. Eh, queda, queda de manifiesto que estos bienes deben ser liquidados de otra manera. Se deben evaluar las liquidaciones parciales anticipadas y estas son medidas que pueden ser tomadas en el corto plazo. También queda claro que los cobros de última milla deben revisarse. Nos parece que a la brevedad debe constituirse un grupo de trabajo que examine los aspectos regulatorios, financieros y de asistencia técnica. Ok, so I understood países. that we should set a working group to, uh, uh, to look at this further. So please, uh, we have other questions from the floor. Thank you for your intervention and I think the UPU Gracias. will take this further up. Thank you very much. The, uh, the floor is now for IPC and that's the last intervention. Sorry, we have to wrap up. IPC, you have the floor. And here. Giving me the floor. Please uh, keep it short. Yes, uh, I am. Um, over the last years, um, the uh, e-commerce market has been growing significantly faster uh, than the postal business in this area. Uh, so I think it is not a sense of urgency only, it is a desperate uh, urgency um, since the Post consider the e-commerce fueled business as the single biggest growth opportunity. And I think that's the reason why uh, 33 posts have asked us to develop this e-commerce interconnect program, which we have finalized by end of last year, and the features are now ready for implementation, not only within our membership, but also these are open to the whole postal world. So I would want to offer to the postal world to share our knowledge and our experience and the features we have developed for the benefit of the customers and in the end the benefit of the business of our posts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this intervention. Uh, with regard to Chile, uh, I got a message from the UPU that you can please forward your proposal to the people of the UPU. They will take care of it, they will handle it. Uh, sorry to be uh, so short on the timing, but we have to go on. So I think we have enough interventions, enough panel debate. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, these excellent speakers and panelists of this afternoon. Give them a warm hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They, asked, they also asked me to wrap up the whole afternoon, and <coughs> I won't do that. I won't do that. You will hear the whole afternoon. But I learned a couple of things, and I will be very briefly. I learned that the global economy is an important element compared to the posts. Yeah? Posts are supporting the global in economy and are the deliverers of the last mile uh, in many, many countries. And I also understood that the last mile will not be electric. Yeah? No electric vehicles and no pizza deliveries, but you go on with your last mile delivery. Uh, innovation, we had a good session on innovation and I learned from innovation that you need CEO and top management attention to have innovation in your company and to bring it live. And last of all, I think this important session on e-commerce, the big future for us, but there were some strong messages that we can't miss the boat. We can't miss the boat and Ecompro, Mr. Hussein, I think you will deal with that in the UPU and with the IB to get it live as Wendy said, 2015, 2016, and then there is still a future for the post among us. With this, thank you very much for your 
patience and for your attention, and thank you for this afternoon. Mesdames, Messieurs, avant que vous ne partiez, un message important. Vous êtes tous cordialement invités à participer à la réception qui est offerte à la sortie de cette salle, une réception qui est offerte par la Côte d'Ivoire. Merci à vous.